section thirteen of the chouan by honore de balzac translated by catherine wormley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three part three he offered her his hand for dinner was now announced mademoiselle de venouille did the honours with a politeness and tact which could only have been acquired by the life and training of a court leave us she whispered to hulot as they left the table you will only frighten him whereas if i am alone with him i shall soon find out all i want to know he has reached the point where a man tells me everything he thinks and sees through my eyes only but afterwards said hulot evidently intending to claim the prisoner afterwards he is to be free free as air she replied but he was taken with arms in his hand no she said making one of those sophistical jokes with which women parry unanswerable arguments i had disarmed him count she said turning back to him as hulot departed i have just obtained your liberty but nothing for nothing she added laughing with her head on one side as if to interrogate him ask all even my name and my honour he cried intoxicated i lay them at your feet he advanced to seize her hand trying to make her take his passion for gratitude but mademoiselle de venouille was not a woman to be thus misled so smiling in a way to give some hope to this new lover she drew back a few steps and said you might make me regret my confidence the imagination of a young girl is more rapid than that of a woman he answered laughing a young girl has more to lose than a woman true those who carry a treasure ought to be distrustful let us quit such conventional language she said and talk seriously you are to give a ball at st james i hear that your headquarters arsenals and base of supplies are there when is the ball to be to-morrow evening you will not be surprised if a slandered woman desires with a woman's obstinacy to obtain a public reparation for the insults offered to her in presence of those who witnessed them i shall go to your ball i ask you to give me your protection from the moment i enter the room until i leave it i ask nothing more than a promise she added as he laid his hand on his heart i abhor oaths they are too like precautions tell me only that you engage to protect my person from all dangers criminal or shameful promise to repair the wrong you did me by openly acknowledging that i am the daughter of the duc de venouille but say nothing of the trials i have borne in being illegitimate this will pay your debt to me ha two hours attendance on a woman in a ballroom is not so dear a ransom for your life is it you are not worth a ducat more her smile took the insult from her words what do you ask for the gun said the count laughing oh more than i do for you what is it secrecy believe me my dear count a woman is never fathomed except by a woman i am certain that if you say one word of this i shall be murdered on my way to that ball yesterday i had warning enough yes that woman is quick to act ah i implore you she said contrive that no harm shall come to me at the ball you will be there under my protection said the count proudly but he added with a doubtful air are you coming for the sake of Montaran? you wish to know more than i know myself she answered laughing now go she added after a pause i will take you to the gate of the town myself for this seems to me a cannibal warfare then you do feel some interest in me exclaimed the count ah mademoiselle permit me to hope that you will not be insensible to my friendship for that sentiment must content me must it not he added with a conceited air ah diviner she said putting on the gay expression a woman assumes when she makes an avowal which compromises neither her dignity nor her secret sentiments 
then having slipped on a pelisse she accompanied him as far as the nid oak crocks when they reached the end of the path she said monsieur be absolutely silent on all this even to the marquis and she laid her finger on both lips the count emboldened by so much kindness took her hand she let him do so as though it were a great favour and he kissed it tenderly oh mademoiselle he cried on knowing himself beyond all danger rely on me for life for death though i owe you a gratitude equal to that i owe my mother it will be very difficult to restrain my feelings to mere respect he sprang into the narrow pathway after watching him till he reached the rocks of saint sulpice marie nodded her head in sign of satisfaction saying to herself in a low voice that fat fellow has given me more than his life for his life i can make him my creator at a very little cost creature or creator that's all the difference there is between one man and another she did not finish her thought but with a look of despair she turned and re-entered the port saint leonard where hulot and corentin were awaiting her two more days she cried and then she stopped observing that they were not alone he shall fall under your guns she whispered to hulot the commandant recoiled a step and looked with a jeering contempt impossible to render at the woman whose features and expression gave no sign whatever of relenting there is one thing remarkable about women they never reason about their blameworthy actions feeling carries them off their feet even in their dissimulation there is an element of sincerity and in women alone crime may exist without baseness for it often happens that they do not know how it came about that they committed it i am going to st james to a ball the chouan give to-morrow night and but said corentin interrupting her that is fifteen miles distant had i not better accompany you you think a great deal too much of something i never think of at all she replied and that is yourself marie's contempt for corentin was extremely pleasing to hulot who made his well-known grimace as she turned away in the direction of her own house corentin followed her with his eyes letting his face express a consciousness of the fatal power he knew he could exercise over the charming creature by working upon the passions which sooner or later he believed would give her to him as soon as mademoiselle de venouille reached home she began to deliberate on her ball dress francine accustomed to obey without understanding her mistress's motives opened the trunks and suggested a greek costume the republican fashions of those days were all greek in style marie chose one which could be put in a box that was easy to carry francine my dear i'm going on an excursion into the country do you want to go with me or will you stay behind stay behind exclaimed francine then who would dress you where have you put that glove i gave you this morning here it is sew this green ribbon into it and above all take plenty of money then noticing that francine was taking out a number of the new republican coins she cried out not those they would get us murdered send jeremy to corentin no stay the wretch would follow me send to the commandant ask him from me for some six franc crowns with the feminine sagacity which takes in the smallest detail she thought of everything while francine was completing the arrangements for this extraordinary trip marie practised the art of imitating an owl and so far succeeded in rivalling marchaterre that the illusion was a good one at midnight she left fougere by the gate of saint leonard took the little path to need oaks crocks and started followed by francine to cross the val de Gibery, with a firm step under the impulse of that strong will which gives to the body and its bearing 
such an expression of force to leave a ballroom with sufficient care to avoid a cold is an important affair to the health of a woman but let her have a passion in her heart and her body becomes adamant such an enterprise as marie had now undertaken would have floated in a bold man's mind for a long time but mademoiselle de venouille had no sooner thought of it than its dangers became to her attractions you are starting without asking god to bless you said francine turning to look at the tower of st leonard the pious breton stopped clasped her hands and said an ave to st anne of Auré, imploring her to bless their expedition during which time her mistress waited pensively looking first at the artless attitude of her maid who was praying fervently and then at the effects of the vaporous moonlight as it glided among the traceries of the church building giving to the granite all the delicacy of filigree the pair soon reached the hut of galop chopin light as their steps were they roused one of those huge watch-dogs on whose fidelity the bretons rely putting no fastening to their doors but a simple latch the dog ran to the strangers and his bark became so threatening that they were forced to retreat a few steps and call for help but no one came mademoiselle de venouille then gave the owl's cry and instantly the rusty hinges of the door made a creaking sound and galope chopin who had risen hastily put out his head i wish to go to st james said marie showing the gar glove monsieur le comte de bovin told me that you would take me there and protect me on the way therefore be good enough to get us two riding donkeys and make yourself ready to go with us time is precious for if we do not get to st james before to-morrow night i can neither see the ball nor the gar galop chopin completely bewildered took the glove and turned it over and over after lighting a pitch candle about a finger thick and the colour of gingerbread this article of consumption imported into brittany from the north was only one more proof to the eyes in this strange country of a utter ignorance of all commercial principles even the commonest after seeing the green ribbon staring at mademoiselle de venouille scratching his ear and drinking a beaker of cider having first offered a glass to the beautiful lady galop chopin left her seated before the table and went to fetch the required donkeys the violet gleam cast by the pitch candle was now powerful enough to counteract the fitful moonlight which touched the dark floor and furniture of the smoke-blackened cottage with luminous points the little boy had lifted his pretty head inquisitively and above it two cows were poking their rosy muzzles and brilliant eyes through the holes in the stable wall the big dog whose countenance was by no means the least intelligent of the family seemed to be examining the strangers with as much curiosity as the little boy a painter would have stopped to admire the night effects of this scene but marie not wishing to enter into conversation with barbette who sat up in bed and began to show signs of amazement at recognizing her left the hovel to escape its fetid air and the questions of its mistress she ran quickly up the stone staircase behind the cottage admiring the vast details of the landscape the aspect of which underwent as many changes as spectators made steps either upward to the summits or downward to the valleys the moonlight was now enveloping like a luminous mist the valley of Cuisnon. certainly a woman whose heart was burdened with a despised love would be sensitive to the melancholy which that soft brilliancy inspires in the soul by the weird appearance it gives to objects and the colours with which it tints the streams the silence was presently broken by the braying of a donkey marie went quickly back to the hut and the party started galop chopin armed with a double-barrelled gun wore a long goatskin which gave him something the look of robinson crusoe his blotched face seamed with wrinkles was scarcely visible under the broad-brimmed hat which the breton peasants still retain as a tradition of the olden time proud to have won after their servitude the right to wear the former ornament of seigneurial heads this nocturnal caravan protected by a guide 
whose clothing attitudes and person had something patriarchal about them bore no little resemblance to the flight into egypt as we see it represented by the sombre brush of rembrandt galop chopin carefully avoided the main road and guided the two women through the labyrinth of byways which intersect brittany mademoiselle de venouille then understood the chouan warfare in threading these complicated paths she could better appreciate the condition of a country which when she saw it from an elevation had seemed to her so charming but into which it was necessary to penetrate before the dangers and inextricable difficulties of it could be understood round each field and from time immemorial the peasants have piled mud walls about six feet high and prismatic in shape on the top of which grow chestnuts oaks and beeches the walls thus planted are called hedges norman hedges and the long branches of the trees sweeping over the pathways arch them sunken between these walls made of a clay soil the paths are like the covered ways of a fortification and where the granite rock which in these regions comes to the surface of the ground does not make a sort of rugged natural pavement they become so impracticable that the smallest vehicles can only be drawn over them by two pairs of oxen or breton horses which are small but usually vigorous these byways are so swampy that foot passengers have gradually by long usage made other paths beside them on the hedge banks which are called roats and these begin and end with each division into fields in order to cross from one field to another it is necessary to climb the clay banks by means of steps which are often very slippery after a rain travellers have many other obstacles to encounter in these intricate paths thus surrounded each field is closed by what is called in the west an achalier that is a trunk or stout branch of a tree one end of which being pierced is fitted to an upright post which serves as a pivot on which it turns one end of the chalier projects far enough beyond the pivot to hold a weight and this singular rustic gate the post of which rests in a hole made in the bank is so easy to work that a child can handle it sometimes the peasants economize the stone which forms the weight by lengthening the trunk or branch beyond the pivot this method of enclosure varies with the genius of each proprietor sometimes it consists of a single trunk or branch both ends of which are embedded in the bank in other places it looks like a gate and is made of several slim branches placed at regular distances like the steps of a ladder lying horizontally the form turns like the echelier on a pivot these hedges and echelier give the region the appearance of a huge chessboard each field forming a square perfectly isolated from the rest closed like a fortress and protected by ramparts the gate which is very easy to defend is a dangerous spot for assailants the breton peasant thinks he improves his fallow land by encouraging the growth of gorse a shrub so well treated in these regions that it soon attains the height of a man this delusion worthy of a population which puts its manure on the highest spot in the courtyard has covered the soil to a proportion of one-fourth with masses of gorse in the midst of which a thousand men might ambush also there is scarcely a field without a number of old apple trees the fruit being used for cider which kill the vegetation wherever their branches cover the ground now if the reader will reflect on the small extent of open ground within these hedges and large trees whose hungry roots impoverish the soil he will have an idea of the cultivation and general character of the region through which mademoiselle de venouille was now passing it is difficult to say whether the object of these enclosures is to avoid all disputes of possession or whether the custom is a lazy one of keeping the cattle from straying without the trouble of watching them at any rate such formidable barriers are permanent obstacles which make these regions impenetrable and ordinary warfare impossible there lies the whole secret of the chouan war mademoiselle de venouille saw plainly the necessity the republic was under to strangle the disaffection by means of police and by negotiation rather than by a useless employment of military force what could be done in fact with a people wise enough to despise the possession of towns 
and hold to that of an open country already furnished with indestructible fortifications surely nothing except negotiate especially as the whole active strength of these deluded peasants lay in a single able and enterprising leader she admired the genius of the minister who sitting in his study had been able to grasp the true way of procuring peace she thought she understood the considerations which act on the minds of men powerful enough to take a bird's-eye view of an empire men whose actions criminal in the eyes of the masses are the outcome of a vast and intelligent thought there is in these terrible souls some mysterious blending of the force of fate and that of destiny some prescience which suddenly elevates them above their fellows the masses seek them for a time in their own ranks then they raise their eyes and see these lordly souls above them such reflections as these seem to mademoiselle de venouille to justify and even to ennoble her thoughts of vengeance this travail of her soul and its expectations gave her vigour enough to bear the unusual fatigues of this strange journey at the end of each property galop chopin made the women dismount from their donkeys and climb the obstructions then mounting again they made their way through the boggy paths which already felt the approach of winter the combination of tall trees sunken paths and enclosed places kept the soil in a state of humidity which wrapped the travellers in a mantle of ice however after much wearisome fatigue they managed to reach the woods of marigny by sunrise the journey then became less difficult and led by a broad footway through the forest the arch formed by the branches and the great size of the trees protected the travellers from the weather and the many difficulties of the first half of their way did not recur they had hardly gone a couple of miles through the woods before they heard a confused noise of distant voices and the tinkling of a bell the silvery tones of which did not have the monotonous sound given by the movements of cattle gallop chopin listened with great attention as he walked along to this melody presently a puff of wind brought several chanted words to his ear which seemed to affect him powerfully for he suddenly turned the weary donkeys into a by-path which led away from st james paying no attention to the remonstrances of mademoiselle de venouille whose fears were increased by the darkness of the forest path along which their guide now led them to right and left were enormous blocks of granite laid one upon the other of whimsical shape across them huge roots had glided like monstrous serpents seeking from afar the juicy nourishment enjoyed by a few beeches the two sides of the road resembled the subterranean grottoes that are famous for stalactites immense festoons of stone where the darkling verdure of ivy and holly allied itself to the green-gray patches of the moss and lichen hid the precipices and the openings into several caves when the three travellers had gone a few steps through a very narrow path a most surprising spectacle suddenly unfolded itself to mademoiselle de venouille's eyes and made her understand the obstinacy of her chouan guide a semicircular basin of granite blocks formed an amphitheatre on the rough tiers of which rose tall black pines and yellowing chestnuts one above the other like a vast circus where the wintry sun shed its pale colours rather than poured its light and autumn had spread her tawny carpet of fallen leaves about the middle of this hall which seemed to have had the deluge for its architect stood three enormous druid stones a vast altar on which was raised an old church banner about a hundred men kneeling with bared heads were praying fervently in this natural enclosure where a priest assisted by two other ecclesiastics was saying mass the poverty of the sacerdotal vestments the feeble voice of the priest which echoed like a murmur through the open space the praying men filled with conviction and united by one and the same sentiment the bare cross the wild and barren temple the dawning day gave the primitive character of the earlier times of christianity to the scene mademoiselle de venouille was struck with admiration this mass said in the depths of the woods 
this worship driven back by persecution to its sources the poesy of ancient times revived in the midst of this weird and romantic nature these armed and unarmed chouan cruel and praying men yet children all these things resemble nothing that she had ever seen or yet imagined she remembered admiring in her childhood the pomps of the roman church so pleasing to the senses but she knew nothing of god alone his cross on the altar his altar the earth in place of the carved foliage of a gothic cathedral the autumnal trees upheld the sky instead of a thousand colours thrown through stained-glass windows the sun could barely slide its ruddy rays and dull reflections on altar priest and people the men present were a fact a reality and not a system it was a prayer not a religion but human passions the momentary repression of which gave harmony to the picture soon reappeared on this mysterious scene and gave it powerful vitality as mademoiselle de venille reached the spot the reading of the gospel was just over she recognized in the officiating priest not without fear the abbe goudin and she hastily slipped behind a granite block drawing francine after her she was however unable to move galop chopin from the place he had chosen and from which he intended to share in the benefits of the ceremony but she noticed the nature of the ground around her and hoped to be able to evade the danger by getting away when the service was over before the priests through a large fissure of the rock that hid her she saw the abbe goudin mounting a block of granite which served him as a pulpit where he began his sermon with the words in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti all present made the sign of the cross my dear friends continued the abbe let us pray in the first place for the souls of the dead jean coquagru nicolo laferte joseph Bure, francois parquois sulpice coupio all of this parish and dead of wounds received in the fight on mont pelerin and at the siege of fougeres de profundis etc the psalm was recited according to custom by the congregation and the priests taking verses alternately with a fervour which augured well for the success of the sermon when it was over the abbe continued in a voice which became gradually louder and louder for the former jesuit was not unaware that vehemence of delivery was in itself a powerful argument with which to persuade his semi-savage hearers these defenders of our god christians have set you an example of duty he said are you not ashamed of what will be said of you in paradise if it were not for these blessed ones who have just been received with open arms by all the saints our lord might have thought that your parish is inhabited by mohammedans do you know men what is said of you in brittany and in the king's presence what you don't know then i shall tell you they say behold the blues have cast down altars and killed priests and murdered the king and queen they mean to make the parish folk of brittany blues like themselves and send them to fight in foreign lands away from their churches where they run the risk of dying without confession and going eternally to hell and yet the gar of marognier whose churches they have burned stand still with folded arms oh oh this republic of damned souls has sold the property of god and that of the nobles at auction it has shared the proceeds with the blues it has decreed in order to gorge itself with money as it does with blood that a crown shall be only worth three francs instead of six and yet the gar of marognier haven't seized their weapons and driven the blues from brittany ha paradise will be closed to them they can never save their souls that's what they say of you in the king's presence it is your own salvation christians which is at stake your souls are to be saved by fighting for religion and the king saint anne of Valois herself appeared to me yesterday at half-past two o'clock and she said to me these very words which i now repeat to you are you a priest of marignier yes madame ready to serve you i am saint anne of Auray, aunt of god after the manner of brittany i have come to bid you warn the people of marignier that they must not hope for salvation if they do not take arms you are to refuse them absolution from their sins unless they serve god bless their guns and those who gain absolution will never miss the blues because their guns are sanctified she disappeared leaving an odour of incense behind her i marked the spot it is under the oak of the pate doi just where that beautiful wooden virgin was placed by the rector of st james 
to whom the crippled mother of pierre le roi otherwise called marchater came to pray and was cured of all her pains because of her son's good deeds you see her there in the midst of you and you know that she walks without assistance it was a miracle a miracle intended like the resurrection of marie labraquin to prove to you that god will never forsake the breton cause so long as the people fight for his servants and for the king therefore my dear brothers if you wish to save your souls and show yourselves defenders of god and the king you will obey all the orders of the man whom god has sent to us and whom we call the gar then indeed you will no longer be mohammedans you will rank with all the gar of Brittany under the flag of god you can take from the pockets of the blues the money they have stolen from you for if the fields have to go uncultivated while you are making war god and the king will deliver to you the spoils of your enemies shall it be said christians that the gar of morigny are behind the gar of the morabihan the gar of saint georges of vitre or antoine who are all faithful to god and the king will you let them get all the spoils will you stand like heretics with your arms folded when other bretons are saving their souls and saving their king forsake all and follow me says the gospel have we not forsaken our tithes we priests and you i say to you forsake all for this holy war you shall be like the maccabees all will be forgiven you you will find the priests and curates in your midst and you will conquer pay attention to these words christians he said as he ended for this day only have we the power to bless your guns those who do not take advantage of the saint's favour will not find her merciful she will not forgive them or listen to them as she did in the last war this appeal enforced by the power of a loud voice and by many gestures the vehemence of which bathed the orator in perspiration produced apparently very little effect the peasants stood motionless their eyes on the speaker like statues but mademoiselle de venouille presently noticed that this universal attitude was the result of a spell cast by the abbe on the crowd he had like great actors held his audience as one man by addressing their passions and self-interests he had absolved excesses before committal and broken the only bonds which held these boorish men to the practice of religious and social precepts he had prostituted his sacred office to political interests but it must be said that in these times of revolution every man made a weapon of whatever he possessed for the benefit of his party and the pacific cross of jesus became as much an instrument of war as the peasants plough share seeing no one with whom to advise mademoiselle de venouille turned to look for francine and was not a little astonished to see that she shared in the rapt enthusiasm and was devoutly saying her chaplet over some beads which gallop chopin had probably given her during the sermon francine she said in a low voice are you afraid of being a mohammedan oh mademoiselle replied the girl just see pierre's mother she is walking francine's whole attitude showed such deep conviction that marie understood at once the secret of the homily the influence of the clergy over the rural masses and the tremendous effect of the scene which was now beginning the peasants advanced one by one and knelt down presenting their guns to the preacher who laid them upon the altar Caleb chopin offered his old duck shooter the three priests sang the hymn Wainy creator while the celebrant wrapped the instruments of death in bluish clouds of incense waving the smoke into shapes that appeared to interlace one another when the breeze had dispersed the vapour the guns were returned in due order each man received his own on his knees from the hands of the priests who recited a latin prayer as they returned them after the men had regained their places the profound enthusiasm of the congregation mute till then broke forth and resounded in a formidable manner domine salvum fac regem was the prayer which the preacher intoned in an echoing voice and was then sung vehemently by the people the cry had something savage and warlike in it the two notes of the word regem readily interpreted by the peasants were taken with such energy that mademoiselle de venouille's thoughts reverted almost tenderly to the exile bourbon family these recollections awakened those of her past life her memory revived the fetes of a court now dispersed in which she had once such share the face of the marquis entered her reverie with the natural mobility of a woman's mind she forgot the scene before her and reverted to her plans of vengeance which might cost her her life or come to naught under the influence of a look 
seeing a branch of holly the trivial thought crossed her mind that in this decisive moment when she wished to appear in all her beauty at the ball she had no decoration for her hair and she gathered a tuft of the prickly leaves and shining berries with the idea of wearing them ho ho my gun may miss fire on a duck but on a blue never cried galop chopin nodding his head in sign of satisfaction marie examined her guide's face attentively and found it of the type of those she had just seen the old chouan had evidently no more ideas than a child a naive joy wrinkled his cheeks and forehead as he looked at his gun but a pious conviction cast upon that expression of his joy a tinge of fanaticism which brought into his face for an instant the signs of the vices of civilization End of section thirteen section fourteen of the chouan by honore de balzac translated by catherine wormley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three part four presently they reached a village or rather a collection of huts like that of galop chopin where the rest of the congregation arrived before mademoiselle de venouille had finished the milk and bread and butter which formed the meal this irregular company was led by the abbe who held in his hand a rough cross draped with a flag followed by agar who was proudly carrying the parish banner mademoiselle de venouille was compelled to mingle with this detachment which was on its way like herself to st james and would naturally protect her from all danger as soon as galop chopin informed them that the gar glove was in her possession provided always that the abbe did not see her towards sunset the three travellers arrived safely at st james a little town which owes its name to the english by whom it was built in the fourteenth century during their occupation of brittany before entering it mademoiselle de venouille was witness of a strange scene of this strange war to which however she gave little attention she feared to be recognized by some of her enemies and this dread hastened her steps five or six thousand peasants were camping in a field their clothing was not in any degree warlike in fact this tumultuous assembly resembled that of a great fair some attention was needed to even observe that these bretons were armed for their goatskins were so made as to hide their guns and the weapons that were chiefly visible were the scythes with which some of the men had armed themselves while awaiting the distribution of muskets some were eating and drinking others were fighting and quarrelling in loud tones but the greater part were sleeping on the ground an officer in a red uniform attracted mademoiselle de venouille's attention and she supposed him to belong to the english service at a little distance two other officers seemed to be trying to teach a few chouan more intelligent than the rest to handle two cannon which apparently formed the whole artillery of the royalist army shouts hailed the coming of the gar of marronier who were recognized by their banner under cover of the tumult which the newcomers and the priests excited in the camp mademoiselle de venouille was able to make her way past it and into the town without danger she stopped at a plain-looking inn not far from the building where the ball was to be given the town was so full of strangers that she could only obtain one miserable room when she was safely in it galop chopin brought francine the box which contained the ball dress and having done so he stood stock still in an attitude of indescribable irresolution at any other time mademoiselle de venouille would have been much amused to see what a breton peasant can be like when he leaves his native parish but now she broke the charm by opening her purse and producing four crowns of six francs each which she gave him take it she said and if you wish to oblige me you will go straight back to fougeres without entering the camp or drinking any cider the chouan amazed at her liberality 
looked first at the crowns which he had taken and then at mademoiselle de venouille but she made him a sign with her hand and he disappeared how could you send him away mademoiselle said francine don't you see how the place is surrounded we shall never get away and who will protect you here you have a protector of your own said marie maliciously giving in an undertone marchatter's owl cry which she was constantly practising francine coloured and smiled rather sadly at her mistress's gaiety but who is yours she said mademoiselle de venouille plucked out her dagger and showed it to the frightened girl who dropped on a chair and clasped her hands what have you come here for marie she cried in a supplicating voice which asked no answer mademoiselle de venouille was busily twisting the branches of holly which she had gathered i don't know whether this holly will be becoming she said a brilliant skin like mine may possibly bear a dark wreath of this kind what do you think francine several remarks of the same kind as she dressed for the ball showed the absolute self-possession and coolness of this strange woman whoever had listened to her then would have found it hard to believe in the gravity of a situation in which she was risking her life an indian muslin gown rather short and clinging like damp linen revealed the delicate outlines of her shape over this she wore a red drapery numerous folds of which gradually lengthening as they fell by her side took the graceful curves of a greek peplum this voluptuous garment of the pagan priestesses lessened the indecency of the rest of the attire which the fashions of the time suffered women to wear to soften its immodesty still further marie threw a gauze scarf over her shoulders left bare and far too low by the red drapery she wound the long braids of her hair into the flat irregular comb above the nape of the neck which gives such grace to certain antique statues by an artistic elongation of the head while a few stray locks escaping from her forehead fell in shining curls beside her cheeks with a form and head thus dressed she presented a perfect likeness of the noble masterpieces of greek sculpture she smiled as she looked with approval at the arrangement of her hair which brought out the beauties of her face while the scarlet berries of the holly wreath which she had laid upon it repeated charmingly the colour of the peplum as she twisted and turned a few leaves to give capricious diversity to their arrangement she examined her whole costume in a mirror to judge of its general effect i am horrible to-night she said as though she were surrounded by flatterers i look like a statue of liberty she placed the dagger carefully in her bosom leaving the rubies in the hilt exposed their ruddy reflections attracting the eye to the hidden beauties of her shape francine could not bring herself to leave her mistress when marie was ready she made various pretexts to follow her she must help her to take off her mantle and the overshoes which the mud and muck in the streets compelled her to wear though the roads had been sanded for this occasion also the gauze veil which mademoiselle de venouille had thrown over her head to conceal her features from the chouan who were collecting in the streets to watch the company the crowd was in fact so great that they were forced to make their way through two hedges of chouan francine no longer strove to detain her mistress and after giving a few last touches to a costume the greatest charm of which was its exquisite freshness she stationed herself in the courtyard that she might not abandon this beloved mistress to her fate without being able to fly to her succour for the poor girl foresaw only evil in these events a strange scene was taking place in montlance chamber as marie was on her way to the ball the young marquis who had just finished dressing was putting on the broad red ribbon which distinguished him as first in rank of the assembly when the abbe goudin entered the room with an anxious air monsieur le marquis come quickly he said you alone can quell a tumult which has broken out i don't know why among the leaders 
they talk of abandoning the king's cause i think that devil of a riffoel is at the bottom of it such quarrels are always caused by some mere nonsense madame du gois reproached him so i hear for coming to the ball ill-dressed that woman must be crazy cried the marquis to try to riffoel retorted continued the abbe interrupting his chief that if you had given him the money promised him in the king's name enough enough i understand it all now this scene has all been arranged and you are put forward as ambassador i monsieur le marquis said the abbe again interrupting him i am supporting you vigorously and you will i hope do me the justice to believe that the restoration of our altars in france and that of the king upon the throne of his fathers are far more powerful incentives to my humble labours than the bishopric of rennes which you the abbe dared say no more for the marquis smiled bitterly at his last words however the young chief instantly repressed all expression of feeling his brow grew stern and he followed the abbe goudin into a hall where the worst of the clamour was echoing i recognise no authority here riffoel was saying casting angry looks at all about him and laying his hand on the hilt of his sabre do you recognise that of common sense asked the marquis coldly the young chevalier de vassar better known under his patronymic of riffoel was silent before the general of the catholic armies what is all this about gentlemen asked the marquis examining the faces round him this monsieur le marquis said a famous smuggler with the awkwardness of a man of the people who long remains under the yoke of respect to a great lord though he admits no barriers after he has once jumped them and regards the aristocrat as an equal only this he said and you have come in the nick of time to hear it i am no speaker of gilded phrases and i shall say things plainly i commanded five hundred men during the late war since we have taken up arms again i have raised a thousand heads as hard as mine for the service of the king it is now seven years that i have risked my life in the good cause i don't blame you but i say that the labourer is worthy of his hire now to begin with i demand that i be called monsieur de Cotterol. i also demand that the rank of colonel shall be granted me or i send in my adhesion to the first consul let me tell you monsieur le marquis my men and i have a devilishly importunate creditor who must be satisfied he's here he added striking his stomach have the musicians come said the marquis in a contemptuous tone turning to madame du gois but the smuggler had dealt boldly with an important topic and the calculating ambitious minds of those present had been too long in suspense as to what they might hope for from the king to allow the scorn of their new leader to put an end to the scene riffoel hastily blocked the way before montauran and seized his hand to oblige him to remain take care monsieur le marquis he said you are treating far too lightly men who have a right to the gratitude of him whom you are here to represent we know that his majesty has sent you with full powers to judge of our services and we say that they ought to be recognized and rewarded for we risk our heads upon the scaffold daily i know so far as i am concerned that the rank of a brigadier-general you mean colonel no monsieur le marquis charette made me a colonel the rank i mention cannot be denied me i am not arguing for myself i speak for my brave brothers-in-arms whose services ought to be recorded your signature and your promise will suffice them for the present though he added in a low voice i must say they are satisfied with very little but he continued raising his voice when the sun rises on the chateau of versailles to glorify the return of the monarchy after the faithful have conquered france in france for the king will they obtain favours for their families pensions for widows and the restitution of their confiscated property i doubt it but monsieur le marquis we must have certified proof of our services when that time comes i will never distrust the king but i do distrust those cormorants of ministers and courtiers who tingle his ears with talk about the public welfare the honour of france the interests of the crown and other crotchets they will sneer at a loyal vandalian 
or a brave chouan because he is old and the sword he drew for the good cause dangles on his withered legs palsied with exposure can you say that we are wrong in feeling thus you talk well monsieur de vissart but you are over hasty replied the marquis listen marquis said the comte de bovin in a whisper riffowel has really on my word told the truth you are sure yourself to have the ear of the king while the rest of us only see him at a distance and from time to time i will own to you that if you do not give me your word as a gentleman that i shall in due course of time obtain the place of master of woods and waters in france the devil take me if i will risk my neck any longer to conquer normandy for the king is not an easy matter and i demand the order for it but he added colouring there's time enough to think of that god forbid that i should imitate these poor mercenaries and harass you speak to the king for me and that's enough each of the chiefs found means to let the marquis know in a more or less ingenious manner the exaggerated price they set upon their services one modestly demanded the governorship of brittany another a barony this one a promotion that one a command and all wanted pensions well baron said the marquis de monsieur de genique don't you want anything these gentlemen have left me nothing but the crown of france marquis but i might manage to put up with that gentlemen cried the abbe goudin in a loud voice remember that if you are too eager you will spoil everything in the day of victory the king will then be compelled to make concessions to the revolutionists to those jacobins shouted the smuggler ha if the king would let me have my way i'd answer for my thousand men we'd soon wring their necks and be rid of them monsieur de cotereau said the marquis i see some of our invited guests arriving we must all do our best by attention and courtesy to make them share our sacred enterprise you will agree i am sure that this is not the moment to bring forward your demands however just they may be so saying the marquis went to the door as if to meet certain of the country nobles who were entering the room but the bold smuggler barred his way in a respectful manner no no monsieur le marquis excuse me he said the jacobins taught me too well in seventeen ninety three that it is not he who sows and reaps who eats the bread sign this bit of paper for me and to-morrow i'll bring you fifteen hundred gar if not i'll treat with the first consul looking haughtily about him the marquis saw plainly that the boldness of the old partisan and his resolute air were not displeasing to any of the spectators of this debate one man alone sitting by himself in a corner of the room appeared to take no part in the scene and to be chiefly occupied in filling his pipe the contemptuous air with which he glanced at the speakers his modest demeanour and a look of sympathy which the marquis encountered in his eyes made the young leader observe the man whom he then recognised as major brigot and he went suddenly up to him and you what do you want he said oh monsieur le marquis if the king comes back that's all i want but for yourself for myself are you joking the marquis pressed the horny hand of the breton and said to madame de goy who was near them madame i may perish in this enterprise before i have time to make a faithful report to the king on the catholic armies of brittany i charge you in case you live to see the restoration not to forget this honourable man nor the baron de genique there is more devotion in them than in all those other men put together he pointed to the chiefs who were waiting with some impatience till the marquis should reply to their demands they were all holding papers in their hands on which no doubt their services were recorded over the signatures of the various generals of the former war and all were murmuring the abbe goudin and comte de bovon and the baron de genique were consulting how best to help the marquis in rejecting these extravagant demands for they felt the position of the young leader to be extremely delicate suddenly the marquis ran his blue eyes gleaming with satire over the whole assembly and said in a clear voice gentlemen i do not know whether the powers which the king has graciously assigned to me are such that i am able to satisfy your demands he doubtless did not foresee such zeal such devotion on your part you shall judge yourselves of the duties put upon me duties which i shall know how to accomplish 
so saying he left the room and returned immediately holding in his hand an open letter bearing the royal seal and signature these are the letters patent in virtue of which you are to obey me he said they authorize me to govern the provinces of brittany normandy Maine, and anjou in the king's name and to recognize the services of such officers as may distinguish themselves in his armies a movement of satisfaction ran through the assembly the chouan approached the marquis and made a respectful circle round him all eyes fastened on the king's signature the young chief who was standing near the chimney suddenly threw the letters into the fire and they were burned in a second i do not choose to command any cried the young man but those who see a king in the king and not a prey to prey upon you are free gentlemen to leave me madame de Gois, the abbe goudin major brigot the chevalier du vissard the baron du genic and the comte de beauvin raised the cry of vive le roi for a moment the other leaders hesitated then carried away by the noble action of the marquis they begged him to forget what had passed assuring him that letters patent or not he must always be their leader come and dance cried the comte de beauvin and happen what will after all he added gaily it is better my friends to pray to god than the saints let us fight first and see what comes of it ha that's good advice said brigot i have never yet known a day's pay drawn in the morning the assembly dispersed about the rooms where the guests were now arriving the marquis tried in vain to shake off the gloom which darkened his face the chiefs perceived the unfavourable impression made upon a young man whose devotion was still surrounded by all the beautiful illusions of youth and they were ashamed of their action however a joyous gaiety soon enlivened the opening of the ball at which were present the most important personages of the royalist party who unable to judge rightly in the depths of a rebellious province of the actual events of the revolution mistook their hopes for realities the bold operations already begun by montran his name his fortune his capacity raised their courage and caused that political intoxication the most dangerous of all excitements which does not cool till torrents of blood have been uselessly shed in the minds of all present the revolution was nothing more than a passing trouble to the kingdom of france where to their belated eyes nothing was changed the country belonged as it ever did to the house of bourbon the royalists were the lords of the soil as completely as they were four years earlier when hoche obtained less a peace than an armistice the nobles made light of the revolutionists for them bonaparte was another but more fortunate marceau so gaiety reigned the women had come to dance a few only of the chiefs who had fought the blues knew the gravity of the situation but they were well aware that if they talked of the first consul and his power to their benighted companions they could not make themselves understood these men stood apart and looked at the women with indifference madame de Gois, who seemed to do the honours of the ball endeavoured to quiet the impatience of the dancers by dispensing flatteries to each in turn the musicians were tuning their instruments and dancing was about to begin when madame de Gois noticed the gloom on de montrand's face and went hurriedly up to him i hope it is not that vulgar scene you have just had with those clodhoppers which depresses you she said she got no answer the marquis absorbed in thought was listening in fancy to the prophetic reasons which marie had given him in the midst of the same chiefs at la Devetiere, urging him to abandon the struggle of kings against peoples but the young man's soul was too proud too lofty too full perhaps of conviction to abandon an enterprise he had once begun and he decided at this moment to continue it boldly in the face of all obstacles he raised his head haughtily and for the first time noticed that madame de Gois was speaking to him your mind is no doubt at fougere she remarked bitterly seeing how useless her efforts to attract his attention had been ah monsieur i would give my life to put her within your power and see you happy with her then why have you done all you could to kill her because i wish her dead 
or in your arms yes i may have loved the marquis de montreuil when i thought him a hero but now i feel only a pitying friendship for him i see him shorn of all his glory by a fickle love for a worthless woman as for love said the marquis in a sarcastic tone you judge me wrong if i loved that girl madame i might desire her less if it were not for you perhaps i should not think of her at all here she is exclaimed madame de Gois abruptly the haste with which the marquis looked round went to the heart of the woman but the clear light of the wax candles enabled her to see every change on the face of the man she loved so violently and when he turned back his face smiling at her woman's trick she fancied there was still some hope of recovering him what are you laughing at asked the comte de bauvin at a soap bubble which is burst interposed madame de gois gaily the marquis if we are now to believe him is astonished that his heart ever beat the faster for that girl who presumes to call herself mademoiselle de venouille you know who i mean that girl echoed the count madame the author of a wrong is bound to repair it i give you my word of honour that she is really the daughter of the duc de venouille monsieur le comte said the marquis in a changed voice which of your statements am i to believe that of la vivetiere or that now made the loud voice of a servant at the door announced mademoiselle de venouille the count sprang forward instantly offered his hand to the beautiful woman with every mark of profound respect and led her through the inquisitive crowd to the marquis and madame de gois believe the one now made he replied to the astonished young leader madame de gois turned pale at the unwelcome sight of the girl who stood for a moment glancing proudly over the assembled company among whom she sought to find the guests at la bevetiere she awaited the forced salutation of her rival and without even looking at the marquis she allowed the count to lead her to the place of honour beside madame de gois whose bow she returned with an air that was slightly protecting but the latter with a woman's instinct took no offence on the contrary she immediately assumed a smiling friendly manner the extraordinary dress and beauty of mademoiselle de venouille caused a murmur throughout the ballroom when the marquis and madame de gois looked towards the late guests at la vevetiere they saw them in an attitude of respectful admiration which was not assumed each seemed desirous of recovering favour with the misjudged young woman the enemies were in presence of each other this is really magic mademoiselle said madame de gois there is no one like you for surprises have you come all alone all alone replied mademoiselle de venouille so you have only one to kill to-night madame be merciful said madame de gois i cannot express to you the pleasure i have in seeing you again i have truly been overwhelmed by the remembrance of the wrongs i have done you and am most anxious for an occasion to repair them as for those wrongs madame i readily pardoned those you did to me but my heart bleeds for the blues whom you murdered however i excuse all in return for the service you have done me madame de gois lost countenance as she felt her hand pressed by her beautiful rival with insulting courtesy the marquis had hitherto stood motionless but he now seized the arm of the count you have shamefully misled me he said you have compromised my honour i am not a gerant of comedy and i shall have your life or you will have mine marquis said the count haughtily i am ready to give you all the explanations you desire they passed into the next room the witnesses of this scene even those least initiated into the secret began to understand its nature so that when the musicians gave the signal for the dancing to begin no one moved mademoiselle what service have i rendered you that deserves a return said madame de gois biting her lips in a sort of rage did you not enlighten me as to the true character of the marquis de montreuil madame with what utter indifference that man allowed me to go to my death i give him up to you willingly then why are you here asked madame de gois eagerly to recover the respect and consideration you took from me at la vivetiere madame 
as for all the rest make yourself easy even if the marquis returned to me you know very well that a return is never love madame de Groix took mademoiselle de venouille's hand with that affectionate touch and motion which women practise to each other especially in the presence of men well my poor dear child she said i am glad to find you so reasonable if the service i did you was rather harsh she added pressing the hand she held and feeling a desire to rend it as her fingers felt its softness and delicacy it shall at least be thorough listen to me i know the character of the gar he meant to deceive you he neither can nor will marry any woman except ah yes mademoiselle he has accepted his dangerous mission to win the hand of mademoiselle duxel a marriage to which his majesty has promised his countenance ah ah mademoiselle de vernouille added not a word to that scornful ejaculation the young and handsome chevalier du vassard eager to be forgiven for the joke which had led to the insult said la devetiere now came up to her and respectfully invited her to dance she placed her hand in his and they took their places in a quadrille opposite to madame de Gois. the gowns of the royalist women which recalled the fashions of the exile court and their craped and powdered hair seemed absurd as soon as they were contrasted with the attire which republican fashions authorized mademoiselle de venouille to wear this attire which was elegant rich and yet severe was loudly condemned but inwardly envied by all the women present the men could not restrain their admiration for the beauty of her natural hair and the adjustment of a dress the charm of which was in the proportions of the form which it revealed at that moment the marquis and the count re-entered the ballroom behind mademoiselle de venouille who did not turn her head if a mirror had not been there to inform her of montauran's presence she would have known it from madame du gua's face which scarcely concealed under an apparently indifferent air the impatience with which she awaited the conflict which must sooner or later take place between the lovers though the marquis talked with the count and other persons he heard the remarks of all the dancers who from time to time in the mazes of the quadrille took the place of mademoiselle de venouille and her partner positively madame she came alone said one she must be a bold woman replied the lady if i were dressed like that i should feel myself naked said another woman oh the gown is not decent certainly replied her partner but it is so becoming and she is so handsome i am ashamed to look at such perfect dancing for her sake isn't it exactly that of an opera girl said the envious woman do you suppose that she has come here to intrigue for the first consul said another a joke if she has replied the partner where she can't offer innocence as a dowry said the lady laughing the gar turned abruptly to see the lady who uttered this sarcasm and madame de Gois looked at him as if to say you see what people think of her madame said the count laughing so far it is only women who have taken her innocence away from her the marquis privately forgave the count when he ventured to look at his mistress whose beauty was like that of most women brought into relief by the light of the wax candles she turned her back upon him as she resumed her place and went on talking to her partner in a way to let the marquis hear the sweetest and most caressing tones of her voice the first consul sends dangerous ambassadors her partner was saying monsieur she replied you all said that at la devetiere you have the memory of a king replied he disconcerted at his own awkwardness to forgive injuries one must needs remember them she said quickly relieving his embarrassment with a smile are we all included in that amnesty said the marquis approaching her but she darted away in the dance with the gaiety of a child leaving him without an answer he watched her coldly and sadly she saw it and bent her head with one of those coquettish motions which the graceful lines of her throat enabled her to make omitting no movement or attitude which could prove to him the perfection of her figure she attracted him like hope 
and eluded him like a memory to see her thus was to desire to possess her at any cost she knew that and the sense it gave her of her own beauty shed upon her whole person an inexpressible charm the marquis felt the storm of love of rage of madness rising in his heart he wrung the count's hand violently and left the room is he gone said mademoiselle de venille returning to her place the count gave her a glance and passed into the next room from which he presently returned accompanied by the gar he is mine she thought observing his face in the mirror she received the young leader with a displeased air and said nothing but she smiled as she turned away from him he was so superior to all about him that she was proud of being able to rule him and obeying an instinct which sways all women more or less she resolved to let him know the value of a few gracious words by making him pay dear for them as soon as the quadrille was over all the gentlemen who had been at la de Vitier surrounded mademoiselle de venouille wishing by their flattering attentions to obtain her pardon for the mistake they had made but he whom she longed to see at her feet did not approach the circle over which she now reigned a queen he thinks i still love him she thought and does not wish to be confounded with mere flatterers she refused to dance again then as if the ball were given for her she walked about on the arm of the, the comte de bovin to whom she was pleased to show some familiarity the affair of la vevetiere was by this time known to all present thanks to madame de Gois and the lovers were the object of general attention the marquis dared not again address his mistress a sense of the wrong he had done her and the violence of his returning passion made her seem to him actually terrible on her side marie watched his apparently calm face while she seemed to be observing the ball it is fearfully hot here she said to the count take me to the other side where i can breathe i am stifling here and she motioned towards a small room where a few card-players were assembled the marquis followed her he ventured to hope she had left the crowd to receive him and this supposed favour roused his passion to extreme violence for his love had only increased through the resistance he had made to it during the last few days mademoiselle de venouille still tormented him her eyes so soft and velvety for the count were hard and stern when as if by accident they met his montaran at last made a painful effort and said in a muffled voice will you never forgive me love forgives nothing or it forgives all she said coldly but she added noticing his joyful look it must be love she took the count's arm once more and moved forward into a small boudoir which adjoined the card-room the marquis followed her will you not hear me he said one would really think monsieur she replied that i have come here to meet you and not to vindicate my own self-respect if you do not cease this odious pursuit i shall leave the ballroom ah he cried recollecting one of the crazy actions of the last duc de lorraine let me speak to you so long as i can hold this live coal in my hand he stooped to the hearth and picking up a brand held it tightly mademoiselle de venouille flushed took her arm from that of the count and looked at the marquis in amazement the count softly withdrew leaving them alone together so crazy an action shook marie's heart for there is nothing so persuasive in love as courageous folly you only prove to me she said trying to make him throw away the brand that you are willing to make me suffer cruelly you are extreme in everything on the word of a fool and the slander of a woman you suspected that one who had just saved your life was capable of betraying you yes he said smiling i have been very cruel to you but nevertheless forget it i shall never forget it hear me i have been shamefully deceived but so many circumstances on that fatal day told against you and those circumstances were stronger than your love he hesitated she made a motion of contempt and rose oh marie i shall never cease to believe in you now 
then throw that fire away you are mad open your hand i insist upon it he took delight in still resisting the soft efforts of her fingers but she succeeded in opening the hand she would fain have kissed what good did that do you she said as she tore her handkerchief and laid it on the burn which the marquis covered with his glove madame de Gois had stolen softly into the card-room watching the lovers with furtive eyes but escaping theirs adroitly it was however impossible for her to understand their conversation from their actions if all that they said of me was true you must admit that i am avenged at this moment said marie with a look of malignity which startled the marquis what feeling brought you here he asked do you suppose my dear friend that you can despise a woman like me with impunity i came here for your sake and for my own she continued after a pause laying her hand on the hilt of rubies in her bosom and showing him the blade of her dagger what does all that mean thought madame de Gois. but she continued you still love me at any rate you desire me and the folly you have just committed she added taking his hand proves it to me i will again be that i desire to be and i return to fougere happy love absolves everything you love me i have regained the respect of the man who represents to me the whole world and i can die then you still love me said the marquis have i said so she replied with a scornful look delighting in the torture she was making him endure i have run many risks to come here i have saved m de bauvin's life and he more grateful than others offers me in return his fortune and his name you have never even thought of doing that the marquis bewildered by these words stifled the worst anger he had ever felt supposing that the count had played him false he made no answer ah you reflect she said bitterly mademoiselle replied the young man your doubts justify mine let us leave this room said mademoiselle de venouille catching sight of a corner of madame du gois's gown and rising but the wish to reduce her rival to despair was too strong and she made no further motion to go do you mean to drive me to hell cried the marquis seizing her hand and pressing it violently did you not drive me to hell five days ago are you not leaving me at this very moment uncertain whether your love is sincere or not but how do i know whether your revenge may not lead you to obtain my life to tarnish it instead of killing me ah you do not love me you think of yourself and not of me she said angrily shedding a few tears the coquettish creature well knew the power of her eyes when moistened by tears well then he cried beside himself take my life but dry those tears oh my love my love she exclaimed in a stifled voice those are the words the accents the looks i have longed for to allow me to prefer your happiness to mine but she added i ask one more proof of your love which you say is so great i wish to stay here only so long as may be needed to show the company that you are mine i will not even drink a glass of water in the house of a woman who has twice tried to kill me who is now perhaps plotting mischief against us and she showed the marquis the floating corner of madame de Gois's drapery then she dried her eyes and put her lips to the ear of the young man who quivered as he felt the caress of her warm breath see that everything is prepared for my departure she said you shall take me yourself to fougere and there only will i tell you if i love you for the second time i trust you will you trust me a second time ah marie you have brought me to a point where i know not what i do i am intoxicated by your words your looks by you by you and i am ready to obey you well then make me for an instant very happy let me enjoy the only triumph i desire i want to breathe freely to drink of the life i have dreamed to feed my illusions before they are gone for ever come come to the ballroom and dance with me they re-entered the room together 
and though mademoiselle de venille was as completely satisfied in heart and vanity as any woman ever could be the unfathomable gentleness of her eyes the demure smile on her lips the rapidity of the motions of a gay dance kept the secret of her thoughts as the sea swallows those of the criminal who casts a weighted body into its depths but a murmur of admiration ran through the company as circling in each other's arms voluptuously interlaced with heavy heads and dim sight they waltzed with a sort of frenzy dreaming of the pleasures they hoped to find in a future union a few moments later mademoiselle de venouille and the marquis were in the latter's travelling carriage drawn by four horses surprised to see these enemies hand in hand and evidently understanding each other francine kept silent not daring to ask her mistress whether her conduct was that of treachery or love thanks to the darkness the marquis did not observe mademoiselle de venille's agitation as they neared fougeres the first flush of dawn showed the towers of st leonard in the distance at that moment marie was saying to herself i am going to my death End of section 14section fifteen of the schwan by honore de balzac translated by catherine wormley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three part five as they ascended the first hill the lovers had the same thought they left the carriage and mounted the rise on foot in memory of their first meeting when marie took the young man's arm she thanked him by a smile for respecting her silence then as they reached the summit of the plateau and looked at fougere she threw off her reverie don't come any farther she said my authority cannot save you from the blues to-day showed some surprise she smiled sadly and pointed to a block of granite as if to tell him to sit down while she herself stood before him in a melancholy attitude the rending emotions of her soul no longer permitted her to play a part at that moment she would have knelt on red-hot coals without feeling them any more than the marquis had felt the firebrand he had taken in his hand to prove the strength of his passion it was not until she had contemplated her lover with a look of the deepest anguish that she said to him at last all that you have suspected of me is true the marquis started ah i pray you she said clasping her hands listen to me without interruption i am indeed the daughter of the duc de venouille but his natural daughter my mother a demoiselle de castoran who became a nun to escape the reproaches of her family expiated her fault by fifteen years of sorrow and died at seas where she was abbess on her deathbed she implored for the first time and only for me the help of the man who had betrayed her for she knew she was leaving me without friends without fortune without a future the duke accepted the charge and took me from the roof of francine's mother who had hitherto taken care of me perhaps he liked me because i was beautiful possibly i reminded him of his youth he was one of those great lords of the old regime who took pride in showing how they could get their crimes forgiven by committing them with grace i will say no more he was my father but let me explain to you how my life in paris injured my soul the society of the duc de venouille to which he introduced me was bitten by that scoffing philosophy about which all france was then enthusiastic because it was wittily professed the brilliant conversations which charmed my ear were marked by subtlety of perception and by witty contempt for all that was true and spiritual men laughed at sentiments and pictured them all the better because they did not feel them their satirical epigrams were as fascinating as the light-hearted humour with which they could put a whole adventure into a word and yet they 
had sometimes too much wit and wearied women by making love an art and not a matter of feeling i could not resist the tide and yet my soul was too ardent forgive this pride not to feel that their minds had withered their hearts and the life i led resulted in a perpetual struggle between my natural feelings and beliefs and the vicious habits of mind which i there contracted several superior men took pleasure in developing in me that liberty of thought and contempt for public opinion which do tear from a woman her modesty of soul robbed of which she loses her charm alas my subsequent misfortunes have failed to lessen the faults i learned through opulence my father she continued with a sigh the duc de venuille died after duly recognizing me as his daughter and making provisions for me by his will which considerably reduced the fortune of my brother his legitimate son i found myself one day without a home and without a protector my brother contested the will which made me rich three years of my late life had developed my vanity by satisfying all my fancies my father had created in my nature a need of luxury and given me habits of self-indulgence of which my own mind young and artless as it then was could not perceive either the danger or the tyranny a friend of my father the marechal duc de lenoncourt then seventy years old offered to become my guardian and i found myself soon after the termination of the odious suit in a brilliant home where i enjoyed all the advantages of which my brother's cruelty had deprived me every evening the old marechal came to sit with me and comfort me with kind and consoling words his white hair and the many proofs he gave me of paternal tenderness led me to turn all the feelings of my heart upon him and i felt myself his daughter i accepted his presence hiding none of my caprices from him for i saw how he loved to gratify them i heard one fatal evening that all paris believed me the mistress of the poor old man i was told that it was then beyond my power to recover an innocence thus gratuitously denied me they said that the man who had abused my inexperience could not be lover and would not be my husband the week in which i made this horrible discovery the duke left paris i was shamefully ejected from the house where he had placed me and which did not belong to him up to this point i have told you the truth as though i stood before god but now do not ask a wretched woman to give account of sufferings which are buried in her heart the time came when i found myself married to danton a few days later the storm uprooted the mighty oak around which i had thrown my arms again i was plunged into the worst distress and i resolved to kill myself i don't know whether love of life or the hope of wearying ill fortune and of finding at the bottom of the abyss the happiness which had always escaped me were unconsciously to myself my advisers or whether i was fascinated by the arguments of a young man from vendome who for the last two years has wound himself about me like a serpent round a tree in short i know not how it is that i accepted for a payment of three hundred thousand francs the odious mission of making an unknown man fall in love with me and then betraying him i met you i knew you at once by one of those presentiments which never mislead us yet i tried to doubt my recognition for the more i came to love you the more the certainty appalled me when i saved you from the hands of hulot i abjured the part i had taken i resolved to betray the slaughterers and not their victim i did wrong to play with men with their lives their principles with myself like a thoughtless girl who sees only sentiments in this life i believed you loved me i let myself cling to the hope that my life might begin anew but all things have revealed my past even i myself perhaps for you must have distrusted a woman so passionate as you have found me alas is there no excuse for my love and my deception my life was like a troubled sleep i woke and thought myself a girl i was in alencon where all my memories were pure and chaste 
i had the mad simplicity to think that love would baptize me into innocence for a moment i thought myself pure for i had never loved but last night your passion seemed to me true and a voice cried to me do not deceive him monsieur le marquis she said in a guttural voice which haughtily challenged condemnation know this i am a dishonoured creature unworthy of you from this hour i accept my fate as a lost woman i am weary of playing a part the part of a woman to whom you had brought back the sanctities of her soul virtue is a burden to me i should despise you if you were weak enough to marry me the comte de bovin might commit that folly but you you must be worthy of your future and leave me without regret a courtesan is too exacting i should not love you like the simple artless girl who felt for a moment the delightful hope of being your companion of making you happy of doing you honour of becoming a noble wife but i gather from that futile hope the courage to return to a life of vice and infamy that i may put an eternal barrier between us i sacrifice both honour and fortune to you the pride i take in that sacrifice will support me in my wretchedness fate may dispose of me as it will i will never betray you i shall return to paris there your name will be to me a part of myself and the glory you win will console my grief as for you you are a man and you will forget me farewell she darted away in the direction of the gorges of st sulpice and disappeared before the marquis could rise to detain her but she came back unseen hid herself in a cavity of the rocks and examined the young man with a curiosity mingled with doubt presently she saw him walking like a man overwhelmed without seeming to know where he went can he be weak she thought when he had disappeared and she felt she was parted from him will he understand me she quivered then she turned and went rapidly towards fougere as though she feared the marquis might follow her into the town where certain death awaited him francine what did he say to you she asked when the faithful girl rejoined her ah marie how i pitied him you great lady stab a man with your tongues how did he seem when he came up to you as if he saw me not at all oh marie he loves you yes he loves me or he does not love me there is heaven or hell for me in that she answered between the two extremes there is no spot where i can set my foot after thus carrying out her resolution marie gave way to grief and her face beautified till then by these conflicting sentiments changed for the worse so rapidly that in a single day during which she floated incessantly between hope and despair she lost the glow of beauty and the freshness which has its source in the absence of passion or the ardour of joy anxious to ascertain the result of her mad enterprise hulot and corentin came to see her soon after her return she received them smiling well she said to the commandant whose careworn face had a questioning expression the fox is coming within range of your guns you will soon have a glorious triumph over him what happened asked corentin carelessly giving mademoiselle de venille one of those oblique glances with which diplomatists of his class spy on thought ah she said the gar is more in love than ever i made him come with me to the gates of fougere your power seems to have stopped there remarked corentin the fears of your ci devant are greater than the love you inspire you judge him by yourself she replied with a contemptuous look well then said he unmoved why did you not bring him here to your own house commandant she said to hulot with a coaxing smile if he really loves me would you blame me for saving his life and getting him to leave france the old soldier came quickly up to her took her hand and kissed it with a sort of enthusiasm then he looked at her fixedly and said in a gloomy tone you forget my two friends and my sixty-three men ah commandant she cried with all the naivete of passion he was not accountable for that he was deceived by a bad woman charette's mistress who would i do believe drink the blood of the blues come marie said corentin don't tease the commandant he does not understand such jokes hold your tongue she answered and remember that the day when you displease me too much will have no morrow for you 
i see mademoiselle said hulot without bitterness that i must prepare for a fight you were not strong enough my dear colonel i saw more than six thousand men at st james regular troops artillery and english officers but they cannot do much unless he leads them i agree with fauché his presence is the head in front of everything are we to get his head that's the point said corentin impatiently i don't know she answered carelessly english officers cried hulot angrily that's all that was wanting to make a regular brigand of him ha ha i'll give him english i will it seems to me citizen diplomat said hulot to corentin after the two had taken leave and were at some distance from the house that you allow that girl to send you to the right about when she pleases it is quite natural for you commandant replied corentin with a thoughtful air to see nothing but fighting in what she said to us you soldiers never seem to know there are various ways of making war to use the passions of men and women like wires to be pulled for the benefit of the state to keep the running gear of the great machine we call government in good order and fasten to it the desires of human nature like baited traps which it is fun to watch i call that creating a world like god and putting ourselves at the centre of it you will please allow me to prefer my calling to yours said the soldier curtly you can do as you like with your running gear i recognize no authority but that of the minister of war i have my orders i shall take the field with veterans who don't skulk and face an enemy you want to catch behind oh you can fight if you want to replied corentin from what that girl has dropped close-mouthed as you think she is i can tell you that you'll have to skirmish about and i myself will give you the pleasure of an interview with the gar before long how so asked hulot moving back a step to get a better view of this strange individual mademoiselle de venuille is in love with him replied corentin in a thick voice and perhaps he loves her a marquis a knight of st louis young brilliant perhaps rich what a list of temptations she would be foolish indeed not to look after her own interests and try to marry him rather than betray him the girl is attempting to fool us but i saw hesitation in her eyes they probably have a rendezvous perhaps they've met already well to-morrow i shall have him by the forelock yesterday he was nothing more than the enemy of the republic to-day he is mine and i tell you this every man who has been so rash as to come between that girl and me has died upon the scaffold so saying corentin dropped into a reverie which hindered him from observing the disgust on the face of the honest soldier as he discovered the depths of this intrigue and the mechanism of the means employed by fouché hulot resolved on the spot to thwart corentin in every way that did not conflict essentially with the success of the government and to give the gar a fair chance of dying honourably sword in hand before he could fall a prey to the executioner for whom this agent of the detective police acknowledged himself the purveyor if the first consul would listen to me thought hulot as he turned his back on corentin he would leave those foxes to fight aristocrats and send his soldiers on other business corentin looked coldly after the old soldier whose face had brightened at the resolve and his eyes gleamed with a sardonic expression which showed the mental superiority of this subaltern machiavelli give an ell of blue cloth to those fellows and hang a bit of iron at their waists he said to himself and they'll think there's but one way to kill people then after walking up and down a while very slowly he exclaimed suddenly yes the time has come that woman shall be mine for five years i've been drawing the net round her and i have her now with her i can be a greater man in the government than fouché himself yes if she loses the only man she has ever loved grief will give her to me body and soul but i must be on the watch night and day a few moments later the pale face of this man might have been seen through the window of a house from which he could observe all who entered the cul-de-sac formed by the line of houses running parallel with st leonard one of those houses being that now occupied by mademoiselle de venuille 
with the patience of a cat watching a mouse corentin was there in the same place on the following morning attentive to the slightest noise and subjecting the passers-by to the closest examination the day that was now beginning was a market day although in these calamitous times the peasants rarely risked themselves in the towns corentin presently noticed a small man with a gloomy face wrapped in a goatskin and carrying on his arm a small flat basket he was making his way in the direction of mademoiselle de venuille's house casting careless glances about him corentin watched him enter the house then he ran down into the street meaning to waylay the man as he left but on second thoughts it occurred to him that if he called unexpectedly on mademoiselle de venuille he might surprise by a single glance the secret that was hidden in the basket of the emissary besides he had already learned that it was impossible to extract anything from the inscrutable answers of breton and normans galop chopin cried mademoiselle de venuille when francine brought the man to her does he love me she murmured to herself in a low voice the instinctive hope sent a brilliant colour to her cheeks and joy into her heart galop chopin looked alternately from the mistress to the maid with evident distrust of the latter but a sign from mademoiselle de venuille reassured him madame he said about two o'clock he will be at my house waiting for you emotion prevented mademoiselle de venuille from giving any other reply than a movement of her head but the man understood her meaning at that moment corentin's step was heard in the adjoining room but gallop chopin showed no uneasiness though mademoiselle de venuille's look and shudder warned him of danger and as soon as the spy had entered the room the chouan raised his voice to an ear-splitting tone ha ha he said to francine i tell you there's breton butter and breton butter you want the giberie kind and you won't give more than eleven sous a pound then why did you send me to fetch it it is good butter that he added uncovering the basket to show the pats which barbette had made you ought to be fair my good lady and pay one sou more his hollow voice betrayed no emotion and his green eyes shaded by thick grey eyebrows bore corentin's piercing glance without flinching nonsense my good man you are not here to sell butter you are talking to a lady who never bargained for a thing in her life the trade you run old fellow will shorten you by a head in a very few days and corentin with a friendly tap on the man's shoulder added you can't keep up being a spy of the blues and a spy of the chouan very long galop chopin needed all his presence of mind to subdue his rage and not deny the accusation which his avarice had made a just one he contented himself with saying monsieur is making game of me corentin turned his back on the chouan but while bowing to mademoiselle de venuille whose heart stood still he watched him in the mirror behind her gallop chopin unaware of this gave a glance to francine to which she replied by pointing to the door and saying come with me my man and we will settle the matter between us nothing escaped corentin neither the fear which mademoiselle de venuille could not conceal under a smile nor her colour and the contraction of her features nor the chouan's sign and francine's reply he had seen all convinced that gallop chopin was sent by the marquis he caught the man by the long hairs of his goatskin as he was leaving the room turned him round to face him and said with a keen look where do you live my man i want butter too my good monsieur said the chouan all fougere knows where i live i am corentin exclaimed mademoiselle de venuille interrupting gallop chopin why do you come here at this time of day i am scarcely dressed let that peasant alone he does not understand your tricks any more than i understand the motive of them you can go my man gallop chopin hesitated a moment the indecision real or feigned of the poor devil who knew not which to obey deceived even corentin but the chouan finally after an imperative gesture from the lady left the room with a dragging step mademoiselle de venuille and corentin looked at each other in silence this time maurice 
limpid eyes could not endure the gleam of cruel fire in the man's look the resolute manner in which the spy had forced his way into her room an expression on his face which marie had never seen there before the deadened tones of his shrill voice his whole demeanour all these things alarmed her she felt that a secret struggle was about to take place between them and that he meant to employ against her all the powers of his evil influence but though she had at this moment a full and distinct view of the gulf into which she was plunging she gathered strength from her love to shake off the icy chill of these presentiments corentin she said with a sort of gaiety i hope you are going to let me make my toilet marie he said yes permit me to call you so you don't yet know me listen a much less sagacious man than i would see your love for the marquis de montrand i have several times offered you my heart and hand you have never thought me worthy of you and perhaps you are right but however much you may feel yourself too high too beautiful too superior for me i can compel you to come down to my level my ambition and my maxims have given you a low opinion of me frankly you are mistaken men are not worth even what i rate them at and that is next to nothing i shall certainly attain a position which will gratify your pride who will ever love you better or make you more absolutely mistress of yourself and of him than the man who has loved you now for five years though i run the risk of exciting your suspicions for you cannot conceive that any one should renounce an idolized woman out of excessive love i will now prove to you the unselfishness of my passion if the marquis loves you marry him but before you do so make sure of his sincerity i could not endure to see you deceived for i do prefer your happiness to my own my resolution may surprise you lay it to the prudence of a man who is not so great a fool as to wish to possess a woman against her will i blame myself not you for the failure of my efforts to win you i hope to do so by submission and devotion for i have long as you well know tried to make you happy according to my lights but you have never in any way rewarded me i have suffered you to be near me she said haughtily add that you regret it after involving me in this infamous enterprise do you think that i have any thanks to give you when i proposed to you an enterprise which was not exempt from blame to timid minds he replied audaciously i had only your own prosperity in view as for me whether i succeed or fail i can make all results further my ends if you marry montauran i shall be delighted to serve the bourbons in paris where i am already a member of the clichy club now if circumstances were to put me in correspondence with the princes i should abandon the interests of the republic which is already on its last legs general bonaparte is much too able a man not to know that he can't be in england and in italy at the same time and that is how the republic is about to fall i have no doubt he made the eighteenth brumaire to obtain greater advantages over the bourbons when it came to treating with them he is a long-headed fellow and very keen but the politicians will get the better of him on their own ground the betrayal of france is another scruple which men of superiority leave to fools i won't conceal from you that i have come here with the necessary authority to open negotiations with the chouan or to further their destruction as the case may be for fouché my patron is deep he has always played a double part during the terror he was as much for robespierre as for danton whom you basely abandon she said nonsense he is dead forget him replied corentin come speak honestly to me i have set you the example old hulot is deeper than he looks if you want to escape his vigilance i can help you remember that he holds all the valleys and will instantly detect the rendezvous if you make one in fougere under his very eyes you are at the mercy of his patrols see how quickly he knew that this juan had entered your house his military sagacity will show him that your movements betray those of the gar if montauran loves you mademoiselle de venille had never listened to a more affectionate voice corentin certainly seemed sincere and spoke confidingly the poor girl's heart was so open to generous impressions 
that she was on the point of betraying her secret to the serpent who had her in his folds when it occurred to her that she had no proof beyond his own words of his sincerity and she felt no scruple in blinding him yes she said you are right Corentin. i do love the marquis but he does not love me at least i fear so i can't help fearing that the appointment he wishes me to make with him is a trap but you said yesterday that he came as far as fougere with you returned Corentin. if he had meant to do you bodily harm you wouldn't be here now you've a cold heart Corentin. you can draw shrewd conclusions as to the ordinary events of human life but not on those of passion perhaps that is why you inspire me with such repulsion as you are so clear-sighted you may be able to tell me why a man from whom i separated myself violently two days ago now wishes me to meet him in a house at florigny on the road to mayon at this avowal which seemed to escape her with a recklessness that was not unnatural in so passionate a creature Corentin flushed for he was still young but he gave her a sidelong penetrating look trying to search her soul the girl's artlessness was so well played however that she deceived the spy and he answered with crafty good humour shall i accompany you at a distance i can take a few soldiers with me and be ready to help and obey you very good she said but promise me on your honour no i don't believe in it by your salvation but you don't believe in god by your soul but i don't suppose you have any what pledge can you give me of your fidelity and yet you expect me to trust you and put more than my life my love my vengeance into your hands the slight smile which crossed the pallid lips of the spy showed mademoiselle de venille the danger she had just escaped the man whose nostrils contracted instead of dilating took the hand of his victim kissed it with every mark of the deepest respect and left the room with a bow that was not devoid of grace three hours after this scene mademoiselle de vernouille who feared the man's return left the town furtively by the port st leonard and made her way through the labyrinth of paths to the cottage of gallop chopin led by the dream of at last finding happiness and also by the purpose of saving her lover from the danger that threatened him during this time corentin had gone to find the commandant he had some difficulty in recognizing hulot when he found him in a little square where he was busy with certain military preparations the brave veteran had made a sacrifice the full merit of which may be difficult to appreciate his cue and his moustache were cut off and his hair had a sprinkling of powder he had changed his uniform for a goatskin wore hobnailed shoes a belt full of pistols and carried a heavy carbine in this costume he was reviewing about two hundred of the natives of fougere all in the same kind of dress which was fitted to deceive the eye of the most practised chouan the warlike spirit of the little town and the breton character were fully displayed in this scene which was not at all uncommon here and there a few mothers and sisters were bringing to their sons and brothers gourds filled with brandy or forgotten pistols several old men were examining into the number and condition of the cartridges of these young national guards dressed in the guise of chouan whose gaiety was more in keeping with a hunting expedition than the dangerous duty they were undertaking to them such encounters with chouannerie where the breton of the town fought the breton of the country district had taken the place of the old chivalric tournaments this patriotic enthusiasm may possibly have been connected with certain purchases of the national domain still the benefits of the revolution which were better understood and appreciated in the towns party spirit and a certain national delight in war had a great deal to do with their ardour hulot much gratified was going through the ranks and getting information from goudin on whom he was now bestowing the confidence and goodwill he had formerly shown to meur and gerard a number of the inhabitants stood about watching the preparations and comparing the conduct of their tumultuous contingent with the regulars of hulot's brigade motionless and silent the blues were awaiting under control of their officers the orders of the commandant whose figure they followed with their eyes as he passed from rank to rank of the contingent when corentin came near the old warrior 
he could not help smiling at the change which had taken place in him he looked like a portrait that has little or no resemblance to the original what's all this asked corentin come with us under fire and you'll find out replied hulot oh i'm not a fourgere man said corentin easy to see that citizen retorted goudin a few contemptuous laughs came from the nearest ranks do you think said corentin sharply that the only way to serve france is with bayonets then he turned his back to the laughers and asked a woman beside him if she knew the object of the expedition hey my good man the chouans are at florigny they say there are more than three thousand and they are coming to take fougere florigny cried corentin turning white then the rendezvous is not there is florigny on the road to mayon he asked there are not two florignies replied the woman pointing in the direction of the summit of la pelerine are you going in search of the marquis de montauran said corentin to hulot perhaps i am answered the commandant curtly he is not at florigny said corentin send your troops there by all means but keep a few of those imitation chouans of yours with you and wait for me he is too malignant not to know what he's about thought hulot as corentin made off rapidly he's the king of spies hulot ordered the battalion to start the republican soldiers marched without drums and silently through the narrow suburb which led to the mayon high road forming a blue and red line among the trees and houses the disguised guard followed them but hulot detaining goudin and about a score of the smartest young fellows of the town remained in the little square awaiting corentin whose mysterious manner had piqued his curiosity francine herself told the astute spy whose suspicions he changed into certainty of her mistress's departure inquiring of the post-guard at the port st leonard he learned that mademoiselle de venouille had passed that way rushing to the promenade he was unfortunately in time to see her movements though she was wearing a green dress and hood to be less easily distinguished the rapidity of her almost distracted step enabled him to follow her with his eye through the leafless hedges and to guess the point towards which she was hurrying ha he cried you said you were going to florigny but you are in the valley of gibari i am a fool she has tricked me no matter i can light my lamp by day as well as by night corentin satisfied that he knew the place of the lover's rendezvous returned in all haste to the little square which hulot resolved not to wait any longer was just quitting to rejoin his troops halt general he cried to the commandant who turned round he then told hulot the events relating to the marquis and mademoiselle de venouille and showed him the scheme of which he held a thread hulot struck by his perspicacity seized him by the arm god's thunder citizen you are right he cried the brigands are making a false attack over there to keep the coast clear but the two columns i sent to scour the environs between entrain and vitre have not yet returned so we shall have plenty of reinforcements if we need them and i dare say we shall for the guard is not such a fool as to risk his life without a bodyguard of those damned owls goudin he added go and tell captain lebrun that he must rub those fellows noses at florigny without me and come back yourself in a flash you know the paths i'll wait till you return and then we'll avenge those murders at la vivetiere thunder how he runs he added seeing goudin disappear as if by magic gerard would have loved him on his return goudin found hulot's little band increased in numbers by the arrival of several soldiers taken from the various posts in the town the commandant ordered him to choose a dozen of his compatriots who could best counterfeit the chouan and take them out by the port st leonard so as to creep round the side of the saint sulpice rocks which overlooks the valley of Cousinon, on which was the hovel of gallop chopin hulot himself went out with the rest of his troop by the port st sulpice to reach the summit of the same rocks where according to his calculations he ought to meet the men under beaupied whom he meant to use as a line of sentinels 
from the suburb of saint sulpice to the nid oaks crocks Quentin, satisfied with having delivered over the fate of the gar to his implacable enemies went with all speed to the promenade so as to follow with his eyes the military arrangements of the commandant he soon saw goudin's little squad issuing from the valley of the nonsan and following the line of the rocks to the great valley while hulot creeping round the castle of fougeres was mounting the dangerous path which leads to the summit of saint sulpice the two companies were therefore advancing on parallel lines the trees and shrubs draped by the rich arabesque of the hoar frost threw whitish reflections which enabled the watcher to see the grey lines of the squads in motion when hulot reached the summit of the rocks he detached all the soldiers in uniform from his main body and made them into a line of sentinels each communicating with the other the first with goudin the last with hulot so that no shrub could escape the bayonets of the three lines which were now in a position to hunt the gar across field and mountain the sly old wolf thought Quarantin, as the shining muzzle of the last gun disappeared in the bushes the gar is done for if marie had only betrayed that damned marquis she and i would have been united in the strongest of all bonds a vile deed but she is mine in any case the twelve young men under goudin soon reached the base of the rocks of saint sulpice here goudin himself left the road with six of them jumping the stiff hedge into the first field of gorse that he came to while the other six by his orders did the same on the other side of the road goudin advanced to an apple tree which happened to be in the middle of the field hearing the rustle of this movement through the gorse seven or eight men at the head of whom was beaupier hastily hid behind some chestnut trees which topped the bank of this particular field goudin's men did not see them in spite of the white reflections of the hoar-frost and their own practised sight hush here they are said beaupier cautiously putting out his head the brigands have more men than we but we have em at the muzzles of our guns and we mustn't miss them or by the lord we are not fit to be soldiers of the pope by this time goudin's keen eyes had discovered a few muzzles pointing through the branches at his little squad just then eight voices cried in derision qui vive and eight shots followed the balls whistled round goudin and his men one fell another was shot in the arm the five others who were safe and sound replied with a volley and the cry friends then they marched rapidly on their assailants so as to reach them before they had time to reload we did not know how true we spoke cried goudin as he recognized the uniforms and the battered hats of his own brigade well we behaved like breton and fought before explaining the other men were stupefied on recognizing the little company who the devil would have known them in those goatskins cried beaupier dismally it is a misfortune said goudin but we are all innocent if you are not informed of the sortie what are you doing here he asked a dozen of those chouans are amusing themselves by picking us off and we are getting away as best we can like poisoned rats but by dint of scrambling over these hedges and rocks may the lightning blast em our compasses have got so rusty we are forced to take a rest i think those brigands are now somewhere near the old hovel where you see that smoke good cried goudin you he added to beaupier and his men fall back towards the rocks through the fields and join the line of sentinels you'll find there you can't go with us because you are in uniform we mean to make an end of those curs now the gar is with them i can't stop to tell you more to the right march and don't administer any more shots to our own goatskins you'll know ours by their cravats which they twist round their necks and don't tie goudin left his two wounded men under the apple tree and marched towards gallop chopin's cottage which beaupier had pointed out to him the smoke from the chimney serving as a guide while the young officer was thus closing in upon the chouan the little detachment under hulot had reached a point still parallel with that at which goudin had arrived the old soldier at the head of his men 
was silently gliding along the hedges with the ardour of a young man he jumped them from time to time actively enough casting his wary eyes to the heights and listening with the ear of a hunter to every noise in the third field to which he came he found a woman about thirty years old with bent back hoeing the ground vigorously while a small boy with a sickle in his hand was knocking the hoar-frost from the rushes which he cut and laid in a heap at the noise hulot made in jumping the hedge the boy and his mother raised their heads hulot mistook the young woman for an old one naturally enough wrinkles coming long before their time furrowed her face and neck she was clothed so grotesquely in a worn-out goatskin that if it had not been for a dirty yellow petticoat a distinctive mark of sex hulot would hardly have known the gender she belonged to for the meshes of her long black hair were twisted up and hidden by a red worsted cap the tatters of the little boy did not cover him but left his skin exposed ho oh, old woman cried hulot in a low voice approaching her where is the gar the twenty men who accompany hulot now jumped the hedge hey if you want the gar you'll have to go back the way you came said the woman with a suspicious glance at the troop did i ask you the road to fougere old carcass said hulot roughly by st anne of Valle. have you seen the gar go by i don't know what you mean replied the woman bending over her hoe you damned gars do you want to have us eaten up by the blues who are after us at these words the woman raised her head and gave another look of distrust at the troop as she replied how can the blues be after you i've just seen eight or ten of them who were going back to fougere by the lower road one would think she meant to stab us with that nose of hers cried hulot here look you old nanny goat and he showed her in the distance three or four of his sentinels whose hats guns and uniforms it was easy to recognize are you going to let those fellows cut the throats of men who are sent by marchater to protect the gar he cried angrily ah beg pardon said the woman but it is so easy to be deceived what parish do you belong to st georges replied two or three of the men in the breton patois and we are dying of hunger well there said the woman do you see that smoke down there that's my house follow the path to the right and you will come to the rock above it perhaps you'll meet my man on the way gallop chopin is sure to be on watch to warn the gar he is spending the day in our house she said proudly as you seem to know thank you my good woman replied hulot forward march god's thunder we've got him he added speaking to his men the detachment followed its leader at a quick step through the path pointed out to them the wife of gallop chopin turned pale as she heard the uncatholic oath of the so-called chouan she looked to the gaiters and goatskins of his men then she caught her boy in her arms and sat down on the ground crying may the holy virgin of Valre and the ever-blessed saint labre have pity upon us those men are not ours their shoes have no nails in them run down by the lower road and warn your father you may save his head she said to the boy who disappeared like a deer among the bushes End of section fifteen. Section sixteen of the Chouan by Honore de Balzac. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three, part six. Mademoiselle de Venouille met no one on her way neither blues nor chouan seeing the column of blue smoke which was rising from the half-ruined chimney of galop chopin's melancholy dwelling her heart was seized with a violent palpitation the rapid sonorous beating of which rose to her throat in waves she stopped rested her hand against a tree and watched the smoke which was serving as a beacon to the foes as well as to the friends of the young chieftain never had she felt such overwhelming emotion ah i love him too much she said with a sort of despair to-day perhaps i shall no longer be mistress of myself she hurried over the distance which separated her from the cottage and reached the courtyard 
the filth of which was now stiffened by the frost the big dog sprang up barking but a word from galop chopin silenced him and he wagged his tail as she entered the house marie gave a look which included everything the marquis was not there she breathed more freely and saw with pleasure that the chouan had taken some pains to clean the dirty and only room in his hovel he now took his duck gun bowed silently to his guest and left the house followed by his dog marie went to the threshold of the door and watched him as he took the path to the right of his hut from there she could overlook a series of fields the curious openings to which formed a perspective of gates for the leafless trees and hedges were no longer a barrier to a full view of the country when the chouan's broad hat was out of sight mademoiselle de vernugue turned round to look for the church at fougere but the shed concealed it she cast her eyes over the valley of the Cousnan, which lay before her like a vast sheet of muslin the whiteness of which still further dulled a grey sky laden with snow it was one of those days when nature seems dumb and noises are absorbed by the atmosphere therefore though the blues and their contingent were marching through the country in three lines forming a triangle which drew together as they neared the cottage the silence was so profound that mademoiselle de venouille was overcome by a presentiment which added a sort of physical pain to her mental torture misfortune was in the air at last in a spot where a little curtain of wood closed the perspective gate of gates she saw a young man jumping the barriers like a squirrel and running with astonishing rapidity it is he she thought the gar was dressed as a chouan with a musket slung from his shoulder over his goatskin and would have been quite disguised were it not for the grace of his movements marie withdrew hastily into the cottage obeying one of those instinctive promptings which are as little explicable as fear itself the young man was soon beside her before the chimney where a bright fire was burning both were voiceless fearing to look at each other or even to make a movement one and the same hope united them the same doubt it was agony it was joy monsieur said mademoiselle de vernouille at last in a trembling voice your safety alone has brought me here my safety he said bitterly yes she answered so long as i stay at fougere your life is threatened and i love you too well not to leave it i go to-night leave me ah dear love i shall follow you follow me the blues dear marie what have the blues got to do with our love but it seems impossible that you can stay with me in france and still more impossible that you should leave it with me is there anything impossible to those who love ah true true all is possible have i not the courage to resign you for your sake what you could give yourself to a hateful being whom you did not love and you refuse to make the happiness of a man who adores you whose life you fill who swears to be yours and yours only hear me marie do you love me yes she said then be mine you forget the infamous career of a lost woman i return to it i leave you yes that i may not bring upon your head the contempt that falls on mine without that fear perhaps but if i fear nothing can i be sure of that i am distrustful who can be otherwise in a position like mine if the love we inspire cannot last at least it should be complete and help us to bear with joy the injustice of the world but you what have you done for me you desire me do you think that lifts you above other men suppose i bade you renounce your ideas your hopes your king who will perhaps laugh when he hears you have died for him 
while i would die for you with sacred joy or suppose i should ask you to send your submission to the first consul so that you could follow me to paris or go with me to america away from the world where all is vanity suppose i thus tested you to know if you loved me for myself as at this moment i love you to say all in a word if i wish instead of rising to your level that you should fall to mine what would you do hush marie be silent do not slander yourself he cried poor child i comprehend you if my first desire was passion my passion now is love dear soul of my soul you are as noble as your name i know it as great as you are beautiful i am noble enough i feel myself great enough to force the world to receive you is it because i foresee in you the source of endless incessant pleasure or because i find in your soul those precious qualities which make a man for ever love the one woman i do not know the cause but this i know that my love for you is boundless i know i can no longer live without you yes life would be unbearable unless you are ever with me ever with you ah marie will you not understand me you think to flatter me by the offer of your hand and name she said with apparent haughtiness but looking fixedly at the marquis as if to detect his inmost thought how do you know you would love me six months hence and then what would be my fate no a mistress is the only woman who is sure of a man's heart duty law society the interests of children are poor auxiliaries if her power lasts it gives her joys and flatteries which make the trials of life endurable but to be your wife and become a drag upon you rather than that i prefer passing love in a true one though death and misery be its end yes i could be a virtuous mother a devoted wife but to keep those instincts firmly in a woman's soul the man must not marry her in a rush of passion besides how do i know that you will please me to-morrow no i will not bring evil upon you i leave Brittany, she said observing hesitation in his eyes i return to fougere now where you cannot come to me i can and if to-morrow you see smoke on the rocks of saint sulpice you will know that i shall be with you at night your lover your husband what will you that i be to you i brave all ah alphonse you love me well she said passionately to risk your life before you give it to me he did not answer he looked at her and her eyes fell but he read in her ardent face a passion equal to his own and he held out his arms to her a sort of madness overcame her and she let herself fall softly on his breast resolved to yield to him and turned this yielding to great results staking upon it her future happiness which would become more certain if she came victorious from this crucial test but her head had scarcely touched her lover's shoulder when a slight noise was heard without she tore herself from his arms as if suddenly awakened and sprang from the cottage her coolness came back to her and she thought of the situation he might have accepted me and scorned me she reflected ah if i could think that i would kill him but not yet she added catching sight of beaupier to whom she made a sign which the soldier was quick to understand he turned on his heel pretending to have seen nothing mademoiselle de vernille re-entered the cottage putting her finger to her lips to enjoin silence they are there she whispered in a frightened voice who the blues ah must i die without one kiss take it she said he caught her to him cold and unresisting and gathered from her lips a kiss of horror and of joy for while it was the first it might also be the last then they went together to the door and looked cautiously out the marquis saw Gaudin and his men holding the paths leading to the valley then he turned to the line of gates where the first rotten trunk was guarded by five men without an instant's pause he jumped on the barrel of cider and struck a hole through the thatch of the roof from which to spring upon the rocks behind the house but he drew his head hastily back through the gap he had made for hulot was on the height his retreat was cut off in that direction the marquis turned and looked at his mistress who uttered a cry of despair 
for she heard the tramp of the three detachments near the house go out first he said you shall save me hearing the words to her all-glorious she went out and stood before the door the marquis loaded his musket measuring with his eye the space between the door of the hut and the old rotten trunk where seven men stood the gar fired into their midst and sprang forward instantly forcing a passage through them the three troops rushed towards the opening through which he had passed and saw him running across the field with incredible celerity fire fire a thousand devils you're not frenchmen fire i say called hulot as he shouted these words from the height above his men and goudins fired a volley which was fortunately ill-aimed the marquis reached the gate of the next field but as he did so he was almost caught by goudin who was close upon his heels the gar redoubled his speed nevertheless he and his pursuer reached the next barrier together but the marquis dashed his musket at goudin's head with so good an aim that he stopped his rush it is impossible to depict the anxiety betrayed by marie or the interest of hulot and his troops as they watched the scene they all unconsciously or silently repeated the gestures which they saw the runners making the gar and goudin reached the little wood together but as they did so the latter stopped and darted behind a tree about twenty chouans afraid to fire at a distance lest they should kill their leader rushed from the copse and riddled the tree with balls hulot's men advanced at a run to save goudin who being without arms retreated from tree to tree seizing his opportunity as the chouans reloaded his danger was soon over hulot and the blues met him at the spot where the marquis had thrown his musket at this instant goudin perceived his adversary sitting among the trees and out of breath and he left his comrades firing at the chouan who had retreated behind a lateral hedge slipping round them he darted towards the marquis with the agility of a wild animal observing this manoeuvre the chouan set up a cry to warn their leader and having fired on the blues and their contingent with the gusto of poachers they boldly made a rush for them but hulot's men sprang through the hedge which served them as a rampart and took up bloody revenge the chouan then gained the road which skirted the fields and took the heights which hulot had committed the blunder of abandoning before the blues had time to reform the chouan were entrenched behind the rocks where they could fire with impunity on the republicans if the latter made any attempt to dislodge them while hulot and his soldiers went slowly towards the little wood to meet goudin the men from fougeres busied themselves in rifling the dead chouan and dispatching those who still lived in this fearful war neither party took prisoners the marquis having made good his escape the chouan and the blues mutually recognized their respective positions and the uselessness of continuing the fight so that both sides prepared to retreat ha ha cried one of the fougere men busy about the bodies here's a bird with yellow wings and he showed his companions a purse full of gold which he had just found in the pocket of a stout man dressed in black what's this said another pulling a breviary from the dead man's coat communion bread he's a priest cried the first man flinging the breviary on the ground here's a wretch cried a third finding only two crowns in the pocket of the body he was stripping a cheat but he's got a fine pair of shoes said a soldier beginning to pull them off you can't have them unless they fall to your share said the fougere man dragging the dead feet away and flinging the boots on a heap of clothing already collected another chouan took charge of the money so that lots might be drawn as soon as the troops were all assembled when hulot returned with goudin whose last attempt to overtake the gar was useless as well as perilous he found about a score of his own men and thirty of the contingent standing around eleven of the enemy whose naked bodies were thrown into a ditch at the foot of the bank soldiers cried hulot sternly i forbid you to share that clothing form in line quick commandant said a soldier pointing to his shoes at the points of which five bare toes could be seen on each foot all right about the money but those boots motioning to a pair of hobnail boots with the butt of his gun would fit me like a glove do you want to put english shoes on your feet retorted hulot but said one of the fougere men respectfully we've divided the booty all through the war i don't prevent you civilians from following your own ways replied hulot roughly here goudin here's a purse with three louis said the officer who was distributing the money 
you have run hard and the commandant won't prevent your taking it hulot looked askance at goudin and saw that he turned pale it's my uncle's purse exclaimed the young man exhausted as he was with his run he sprang to the mound of bodies and the first that met his eyes was that of his uncle but he had hardly recognized the rubicund face now furred with blue lines and seen the stiffened arms and the gunshot wound before he gave a stifled cry exclaiming let us be off commandant the blues started hulot gave his arm to his young friend god's thunder he cried never mind it is no great matter but he is dead said goudin dead he was my only relation and though he cursed me still he loved me if the king returns the neighbourhood will want my head and my poor uncle would have saved it what a fool goudin is said one of the men who had stayed behind to share the spoils his uncle was rich and he hasn't had time to make a will and disinherit him the division over the men of fougere rejoined the little battalion of the blues on their way to the town towards midnight the cottage of galop chopin hitherto the scene of life without a care was full of dread and horrible anxiety barbette and her little boy returned at the supper hour one with her heavy burden of rushes the other carrying fodder for the cattle entering the hut they looked about in vain for galop chopin the miserable chamber never looked to them as large so empty was it the fire was out and the darkness the silence seemed to tell of some disaster barbette hastened to make a blaze and to light to orbus the name given to candles made of pitch in the region between the villages of amerique and the upper loire and still used beyond amboise in the vendomois districts barbette did these things with the slowness of a person absorbed in one overpowering feeling she listened to every sound deceived by the whistling of the wind she went off into the door of the hut returning sadly she cleaned two beakers filled them with cider and placed them on the long table now and again she looked at her boy who watched the baking of the buckwheat cakes but did not speak to him the lad's eyes happened to rest on the nails which usually held his father's duck gun and barbette trembled as she noticed that the gun was gone the silence was broken only by the lowing of a cow or the splash of the cider as it dropped at regular intervals from the bung of the cask the poor woman sighed while she poured into three brown earthenware porringers a sort of soup made of milk biscuit broken into bits and boiled chestnuts they must have fought in the field next to the barandiere said the boy go and see replied his mother the child ran to the place where the fighting had as he said taken place in the moonlight he found the heap of bodies but his father was not among them and he came back whistling joyously having picked up several five-franc pieces trampled in the mud and overlooked by the victors his mother was sitting on a stool beside the fire employed in spinning flax he made a negative sign to her and then ten o'clock having struck from the tower of st leonard he went to bed muttering a prayer to the holy virgin of Aure. at dawn barbette who had not closed her eyes gave a cry of joy as she heard in the distance a sound she knew well of hobnailed shoes and soon after galop chopin's scowling face presented itself thanks to saint lavre he said to whom i owe a candle the gar is safe don't forget that we now owe three candles to the saint he seized a beaker of cider and emptied it at a draught without drawing breath when his wife had served his soup and taken his gun and he himself was seated on the wooden bench he said looking at the fire i can't make out how the blues got here the fighting was at florigny who the devil could have told them that the guard was in our house no one knew it but he and the handsome garce and we barbette turned white they made me believe they were the gar of st georges she said trembling it was i who told them the gar was here galop chopin turned pale himself and dropped his porringer on the table i sent the boy to warn you said barbette frightened didn't you meet him the chouan rose and struck his wife so violently that she dropped pale as death upon the bed you cursed woman he said you have killed me then seized with remorse he took her in his arms barbette he cried barbette 
holy virgin my hand was too heavy do you think she said opening her eyes that marche a terre will hear of it the guard will certainly inquire who betrayed him will he tell it to marche a terre marche a terre and pille miche were both at florigny babette breathed a little easier if they touch a hair of your head she cried i'll rinse their glasses with vinegar ah i can't eat said galop chopin anxiously his wife set another pitcher full of cider before him but he paid no heed to it two big tears rolled from the woman's eyes and moistened the deep furrows of her withered face listen to me wife to-morrow morning you must gather faggots on the rocks of st sulpice to the right and st leonard and set fire to them that is a signal agreed upon between the gar and the old rector of st georges who is to come and say mass for him is the guard going to fougere yes to see his handsome garce i have been sent here and there all day about it i think he is going to marry her and carry her off for he told me to hire horses and have them ready on the road to st malo thereupon gallop chopin who was tired out went to bed for an hour or two at the end of which time he again departed later on the following morning he returned having carefully fulfilled all the commissions entrusted to him by the gar finding that marchaterre and pille miche had not appeared at the cottage he relieved the apprehensions of his wife who went off reassured to the rocks of st sulpice where she had collected the night before several piles of faggots now covered with hoar-frost the boy went with her carrying fire in a broken wooden shoe hardly had his wife and son passed out of sight behind the shed when gallop chopin heard the noise of men jumping the successive barriers and he could dimly see through the fog which was growing thicker the forms of two men like moving shadows it is marchaterre and pigamiche he said mentally then he shuddered the two chouans entered the courtyard and showed their gloomy faces under the broad-brimmed hats which made them look like the figures which engravers introduce into their landscapes good morning gallop chopin said marchaterre gravely good morning monsieur marchaterre replied the other humbly will you come in and drink a drop i have some cold buckwheat cake and fresh-made butter that's not to be refused cousin said pigamiche the two chouans entered the cottage so far there was nothing alarming for the master of the house who hastened to fill three beakers from his huge cask of cider while marchaterre and pigamiche sitting on the polished benches on each side of the long table cut the cake and spread it with the rich yellow butter from which the milk spurted as the knife smoothed it gallop chopin placed the beakers full of frothing cider before his guests and the three chouans began to eat but from time to time the master of the house cast sidelong glances at marchaterre as he drank his cider lend me your snuff-box said marchaterre to pigamiche having shaken several pinches into the palm of his hand the breton inhaled the tobacco like a man who is making ready for serious business it is cold said pigamiche rising to shut the upper half of the door the daylight already dim with fog now entered only through the little window and feebly lighted the room and the two seats the fire however gave out a ruddy glow gallop chopin refilled the beakers but his guests refused to drink again and throwing aside their large hats looked at him solemnly their gestures and the look they gave him terrified gallop chopin who fancied he saw blood in the red woollen caps they wore fetch your axe said marchaterre but monsieur marchaterre what do you want it for come cousin you know very well said pigamiche pocketing his snuff-box which marchaterre returned to him you are condemned the two chouans rose together and took their guns monsieur marchaterre i never said one word about the gar i told you to fetch your axe said marchaterre the hapless man knocked against the wooden bedstead of his son and several five-franc pieces rolled on the floor pigamiche picked them up ho ho the blues paid you in new money cried marchaterre as true 
as that's the image of saint lavre said gallo chopin i have told nothing barbette mistook the fougere men for the gar of saint georges and that's the whole of it why do you tell things to your wife said marchater roughly besides cousin we don't want excuses we want your acts you are condemned at a sign from his companion pillemiche helped marchater to seize the victim finding himself in their grasp gallop chopin lost all power and fell on his knees holding up his hands to his slayers in desperation my friends my good friends my cousin he said what will become of my little boy i will take charge of him said marchater my good comrades cried the victim turning livid i am not fit to die don't make me go without confession you have the right to take my life but you've no right to make me lose a blessed eternity that is true said marchater addressing pillemiche the two chouans waited a moment in much uncertainty unable to decide this case of conscience gallop chopin listened to the rustling of the wind as though he still had hope suddenly pillemiche took him by the arm into a corner of the hut confess your sins to me he said and i will tell them to a priest of the true church and if there is any penance to do i will do it for you gallop chopin obtained some respite by the way in which he confessed his sins but in spite of their number and the circumstances of each crime he came finally to the end of them cousin he said imploringly since i am speaking to you as i would to my confessor i do assure you by the holy name of god that i have nothing to reproach myself with except for having now and then buttered my bread on both sides and i call on saint lavre who is there over the chimney-piece to witness that i have never said one word about the gar no my good friends i have not betrayed him very good that will do cousin you can explain all that to god in course of time but let me say good-bye to barbette come said marchater if you don't want us to think you worse than you are behave like a breton and be done with it the two chouans seized him again and threw him on the bench where he gave no other sign of resistance than the instinctive and convulsive motions of an animal uttering a few smothered groans which ceased when the axe fell the head was off at the first blow marchater took it by the hair left the room sought and found a large nail in the rough casing of the door and wound the hair about it leaving the bloody head the eyes of which he did not even close to hang there the two chouans then washed their hands without the least haste in a pot full of water picked up their hats and guns and jumped the gate whistling the ballad of the captain pillemiche began to sing in a hoarse voice as he reached the field the last verses of that rustic song their melody floating on the breeze at the first town her lover dressed her all in white satin at the next town her lover dressed her in gold and silver so beautiful was she they gave her veils to wear in the regiment the tomb became gradually indistinguishable as the chouan got further away but the silence of the country was so great that several of the notes reached barbette's ear as she neared home holding her boy by the hand a peasant woman never listens coldly to that song so popular is it in the west of france and barbette began unconsciously to sing the first verses come let us go my girl let us go to the war let us go it is time brave captain let it not trouble you but my daughter is not for you you shall not have her on earth you shall not have her at sea unless by treachery the father took his daughter he unclothed her and flung her out to sea the captain wiser still into the waves he jumped and to the shore he brought her come let us go my girl let us go to the war let us go it is time at the first town her lover dressed her etc etc as barbette reached this verse of the song where pillemiche had begun it she was entering the courtyard of her home her tongue suddenly stiffened she stood still and a great cry quickly repressed came from her gaping lips what is it mother said the child walk alone she cried pulling her hand away and pushing him roughly you have neither father nor mother the child who was rubbing his shoulder 
and weeping suddenly caught sight of the thing on the nail his childlike face kept the nervous convulsion his crying had caused but he was silent he opened his eyes wide and gazed at the head of his father with a stupid look which betrayed no emotion then his face brutalized by ignorance showed savage curiosity barbette again took his hand grasped it violently and dragged him into the house when pillemiche and marcheterre threw their victim on the bench one of his shoes dropping off fell on the floor beneath his neck and was afterwards filled with blood it was the first thing that met the widow's eye take off your shoe said the mother to her son put your foot in that good remember she cried in a solemn voice your father's shoe never put on your own without remembering how the chouan filled it with his blood and kill the chouan she swayed her head with so convulsive an action that the meshes of her black hair fell upon her neck and gave a sinister expression to her face i call saint labre to witness she said but i vow you to the blues you shall be a soldier to avenge your father kill kill the chouan and do as i do ha they've taken the head of my man and i'm going to give that of the gar to the blues she sprang at a bound on the bed seized a little bag of money from a hiding-place took the hand of the astonished little boy and dragged him after her without giving him time to put on his shoe and was on her way to fougere rapidly without once turning her head to look at the home she abandoned when they reached the summit of the rocks of saint sulpice barbette set fire to the pile of faggots and the boy helped her to pile on the green gorse damp with hoar-frost to make the smoke more dense that fire will last longer than your father longer than i longer than the gar said barbette in a savage voice while the widow of gallop chopin and her son with his bloody foot stood watching the one with a gloomy expression of revenge the other with curiosity the curling of the smoke mademoiselle de venuille's eyes were fastened on the same rock trying but in vain to see her lover's signal the fog which had thickened buried the whole region under a veil its grey tints obscuring even the outlines of the scenery that was nearest the town she examined with tender anxiety the rocks the castle the buildings which loomed like shadows through the mist near her window several trees stood out against this blue-grey background the sun gave a dull tone as of tarnished silver to the sky its rays coloured the bare branches of the trees where a few last leaves were fluttering with a dingy red but too many dear and delightful sentiments filled marie's soul to let her notice the ill omens of a scene so out of harmony with the joys she was tasting in advance for the last two days her ideas had undergone a change the fierce undisciplined vehemence of her passions had yielded under the influence of the equable atmosphere which a true love gives to life the certainty of being loved sought through so many perils had given birth to a desire to re-enter those social conditions which sanction love and which despair alone had made her lead to love for a moment only now seemed to her a species of weakness she saw herself lifted from the dregs of society where misfortune had driven her to the high rank in which her father had meant to place her her vanity repressed for a time by the cruel alternations of hope and misconception was awakened and showed her all the benefits of a great position born in a certain way to rank marriage to a marquis meant to her mind living and acting in the sphere that belonged to her having known the chances and changes of an adventurous life she could appreciate better than other women the grandeur of the feelings which make the family marriage and motherhood with all their cares seemed to her less a task than a rest she loved the calm and virtuous life she saw through the clouds of this last storm as a woman weary of virtue may sometimes covet an illicit passion virtue was to her a new seduction perhaps she thought leaving the window without seeing the signal on the rocks of saint sulpice i have been too coquettish with him but i knew he loved me francine it is not a dream 
to-night i shall be marquise de montran what have i done to deserve such perfect happiness oh i love him and love alone is love's reward and yet i think god means to recompense me for taking heart through all my misery he means me to forget my sufferings for you know francine i have suffered to-night marquise de montauran you marie ah until it is done i cannot believe it who has told him your true goodness dear child he has more than his handsome eyes to see me with he has a soul if you have seen him as i have in danger oh he knows how to love he is so brave if you really love him why do you let him come to fougere we had no time to say one word to each other when the blues surprised us besides his coming is a proof of love can i ever have proofs enough and now francine do my hair but she pulled it down a score of times with motions that seemed electric as though some stormy thoughts were mingling still with the arts of her coquetry as she rolled a curl or smoothed the shining plaits she asked herself with a remnant of distrust whether the marquis were deceiving her but treachery seemed to her impossible for did he not expose himself to instant vengeance by entering fougere while studying in her mirror the effects of a sidelong glance a smile a gentle frown an attitude of anger or of love or disdain she was sinking some woman's while by which to probe to the last instant the heart of the young leader you are right francine she said i wished with you that the marriage were over this is the last of my cloudy days it is big with death or happiness oh that fog is dreadful she went on again looking towards the heights of saint sulpice which were still veiled in mist she began to arrange the silken muslin curtains which draped the window making them intercept the light and produce in the room a voluptuous chiaroscuro francine she said take away those knick-knacks on the mantelpiece leave only the clock and two dresden vases i'll fill those vases myself with the flowers corentin brought me take out the chairs i want only the sofa and a fan to you then sweep the carpet so as to bring out the colours and put wax candles in the sconces and on the mantel marie looked long and carefully at the old tapestry on the walls guided by her innate taste she found among the brilliant tints of these hangings the shades by which to connect their antique beauty with the furniture and accessories of the boudoir either by the harmony of colour or the charm of contrast the same thought guided the arrangement of the flowers with which she filled the twisted vases which decorated her chamber the sofa was placed beside the fire on either side of the bed which filled the space parallel to that of the chimney she placed on gilded tables tall dresden vases filled with foliage and flowers that were sweetly fragrant she quivered more than once as she arranged the folds of the green damask above the bed and studied the fall of the drapery which concealed it such preparations have a secret ineffable happiness about them they cause so many delightful emotions that a woman as she makes them forgets her doubts and mademoiselle de vanille forgot hers there is in truth a religious sentiment in the multiplicity of cares taken for one beloved who is not there to see them and reward them but who will reward them later with the approving smile these tender preparations always so fully understood obtain women as they make them love in advance for there are few indeed who would not say to themselves as mademoiselle de vernouille now thought to-night i shall be happy that soft hope lies in every fold of silk or muslin insensibly the harmony the woman makes about her gives an atmosphere of love in which she breathes to her these things are beings witnesses she has made them the sharers of her coming joy every movement every thought brings that joy within her grasp but presently she expects no longer she hopes no more she questions silence the slightest sound is to her an omen doubt hooks its claws once more into her heart she burns she trembles she is grasped by a thought which holds her like a physical force she alternates from triumph to agony and without the hope of coming happiness she could not endure the torture a score of times did mademoiselle de vernouille raise the window-curtain hoping to see the smoke rising above the rocks 
but the fog only took a grayer tone which her excited imagination turned into a warning at last she let fall the curtain impatiently resolving not to raise it again she looked gloomily around the charming room to which she had given a soul and a voice asking herself if it were done in vain and this thought brought her back to her preparations francine she said drawing her into a little dressing-room which adjoined her chamber and was lighted through a small round window opening on a dark corner of the fortifications where they joined the rock terrace of the promenade put everything in order as for the salon you can leave that as it is she added with a smile which women reserve for their nearest friends the delicate sentiment of which men seldom understand ah how sweet you are exclaimed the little maid a lover is our beauty foolish women that we are she replied gaily francine left her lying on the ottoman and went away convinced that whether her mistress were loved or not she would never betray montreal end of section sixteen section seventeen of the chouan by honore de balzac translated by catherine wormley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three part seven are you sure of what you are telling me old woman hulot was saying to barbette who had sought him out as soon as she had reached fougere have you got eyes look at the rocks of saint sulpice there my good man to the right of saint leonard corentin who was with hulot looked towards the summit in the direction pointed out by barbette and as the fog was beginning to lift he could see with some distinctness the column of white smoke the woman told of but when is he coming old woman to-night or this evening my good man said barbette i don't know why do you betray your own side said hulot quickly having drawn her out of hearing of corentin ah general see my boy's foot that's washed in the blood of my man whom the chouan have killed like a calf to punish him for the few words you got out of me the other day when i was working in the fields take my boy for you've deprived him of his father and his mother make a blue of him my good man teach him to kill chouan here there's two hundred crowns keep them for him if he is careful they'll last him long for it took his father twelve years to lay them by hulot looked with amazement at the pale and withered woman whose eyes were dry but you mother he said what will become of you you had better keep the money i she replied shaking her head sadly i don't need anything in this world you might bolt me into that highest tower over there pointing to the battlements of the castle and the chouan would contrive to come and kill me she kissed her boy with an awful expression of grief looked at him wiped away her tears looked at him again and disappeared commandant said corentin this is an occasion when two heads are better than one we know all and yet we know nothing if you surrounded mademoiselle de venuille's house now you will only warn her neither you nor i nor your blues and your battalions are strong enough to get the better of that girl if she takes it into her head to save the sea devant the fellow is brave and consequently wily he is a young man full of daring we can never get hold of him as he enters fougere perhaps he is here already domiciliary visit absurdity that's no good it will only give them warning well said hulot impatiently i shall tell the sentry on the place saint leonard to keep his eye on the house and pass word along the other sentinels if a young man enters it as soon as the signal reaches me i shall take a corporal and four men and and said corentin interrupting the old soldier if the young man is not the marquis or if the marquis doesn't go in by the front door or if he is already there if 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 what then corentin looked at the commandant with so insulting an air of superiority that the old soldier shouted out god's thousand thunders get out of here citizen of hell what have i got to do with your intrigues if that cock chafer buzzes into my guard-room i'll shoot him if i hear he is in a house i shall surround that house and take him when he leaves it 
and shoot him but may the devil get me if i soil my uniform with any of your tricks commandant the order of the minister states that you are to obey mademoiselle de venouille let her come and give them to me herself and i'll see about it well citizen said corentin haughtily she shall come she shall tell you herself the hour at which she expects the ci devant possibly she won't be easy till you do post the sentinels round the house the devil is made man thought the old leader as he watched corentin hurrying up the queen's staircase at the foot of which this scene had taken place he means to deliver a montauran bound hand and foot with no chance to fight for his life and i shall be harassed to death with a court-martial however he added shrugging his shoulders the gar certainly is an enemy of the republic and he killed my poor gerard and his death will make a noble the less the devil take him he turned on the heels of his boots and went off whistling the marseillaise to inspect his guard-rooms mademoiselle de venouille was absorbed in one of those meditations the mysteries of which are buried in the soul and proved by their thousand contradictory emotions to the woman who undergoes them that it is possible to have a stormy and passionate existence between four walls without even moving from the ottoman on which her very life is burning itself away she had reached the final scene of the drama she had come to enact and her mind was going over and over the phases of love and anger which had so powerfully stirred her during the ten days which had now elapsed since her first meeting with the marquis a man's step suddenly sounded in the adjoining room and she trembled the door opened she turned quickly and saw corentin you little cheat said the police agent when will you stop deceiving ah marie marie you are playing a dangerous game by not taking me into your confidence why do you play such tricks without consulting me if the marquis escapes his fate it won't be your fault will it she replied sarcastically monsieur she continued in a grave voice by what right do you come into my house your house he exclaimed you remind me she answered coldly that i have no home perhaps you chose this house deliberately for the purpose of committing murder i shall leave it i would live in a desert to get away from spies say the word interrupted corentin but this house is neither yours nor mine it belongs to the government and as for leaving it you will do nothing of the kind he added giving her a diabolical look mademoiselle de venouille rose indignantly made a few steps to leave the room but stopped short suddenly as corentin raised the curtain of the window and beckoned her with a smile to come to him do you see that column of smoke he asked with the calmness he always kept on his livid face however intense his feelings might be what has my departure to do with that burning brush she asked why does your voice tremble he said you poor thing he added in a gentle voice i know all the marquis is coming to fougeres this evening and it is not with any intention of delivering him to us that you have arranged this boudoir and the flowers and candles mademoiselle de venouille turned pale for she saw her lover's death in the eyes of this tiger with the human face and her love for him rose to frenzy each hair on her head caused her an acute pain she could not endure and she fell on the ottoman corentin stood looking at her for a moment with his arms folded half pleased at inflicting a torture which avenged him for the contempt and the sarcasms this woman had heaped upon his head half grieved by the sufferings of a creature whose yoke was pleasant to him heavy as it was she loves him he muttered loves him she cried ah what are words corentin he is my life my soul my breath she flung herself at the feet of the man whose silence terrified her soul of vileness she cried i would rather degrade myself to save his life than degrade myself by betraying him i will save him at the cost of my own blood speak what price must i pay you Quentin quivered i came to take your orders marie he said raising her yes marie your insults will not hinder my devotion to your wishes provided you will promise not to deceive me again you must know by this time that no one dupes me with impunity if you want me to love you corentin help me to save him at what hour is he coming asked the spy endeavouring to ask the question calmly alas i do not know they looked at each other in silence i am lost thought mademoiselle de venouille she is deceiving me thought corentin marie he continued 
i have two maxims one is never to believe a single word a woman says to me that's the only means of not being duped the other is to find what interest she has in doing the opposite of what she says and behaving in contradiction to the facts she pretends to confide to me i think that you and i understand each other now perfectly replied mademoiselle de venouille you want proofs of my good faith but i reserve them for the time when you give me some of yours adieu mademoiselle said corentin coolly nonsense said the girl smiling sit down and pray don't sulk but if you do i shall know how to save the marquis without you as for the three hundred thousand francs which are always spread before your eyes i will give them to you in good gold as soon as the marquis is safe corentin rose stepped back a pace or two and looked at marie you have grown rich in a very short time he said in a tone of ill-disguised bitterness mon Turin, she continued will make you a better offer still for his ransom now then prove to me that you have the means of guaranteeing him from all danger and can't you send him away the moment he arrives cried corentin suddenly hulot does not know he is coming and he stopped as if he had said too much but how absurd that you should ask me how to play a trick he said with an easy laugh now listen marie i do feel certain of your loyalty promise me a compensation for all i lose in furthering your wishes and i will make that old fool of a commandant so unsuspicious that the marquis will be as safe at fougere as at st james yes i promise it said the girl with a sort of solemnity no not in that way he said swear it by your mother mademoiselle de venouille shuddered raising a trembling hand she made the oath required by the man whose tone to her had changed so suddenly you can command me he said don't deceive me again and you shall have reason to bless me to-night i will trust you corentin cried mademoiselle de venouille much moved she bowed her head gently towards him and smiled with a kindness not unmixed with surprise as she saw an expression of melancholy tenderness on his face what an enchanting creature thought corentin as he left the house shall i ever get her as a means to fortune and a source of delight to fling herself at my feet oh yes the marquis shall die if i can't get that woman in any other way than by dragging her through the mud i'll sink her in it at any rate he thought as he reached the square unconscious of his steps she no longer distrusts me three hundred thousand francs down she thinks me grasping either the offer was a trick or she is already married to him corentin buried in thought was unable to come to a resolution the fog which the sun had dispersed at midday was now rolling thicker and thicker so that he could hardly see the trees at a little distance that's another piece of ill-luck he muttered as he turned slowly homeward it is impossible to see ten feet the weather protects the lovers how is one to watch a house in such a fog who goes there he cried catching the arm of a boy who seemed to have clambered up the dangerous rocks which made the terrace of the promenade it is i said a childish voice ah the boy with the bloody foot do you want to revenge your father said corentin yes said the child very good do you know the gar yes good again now don't leave me except to do what i bid you and you will obey your mother and earn some big sous do you like sous yes you like sous and you want to kill the gar who killed your father well i'll take care of you ah marie he muttered after a pause you yourself shall betray him as you engage to do she is too violent to suspect me passion never reflects she does not know the marquise's writing yes i can set a trap into which her nature will drive her headlong but i must first see hulot mademoiselle de venouille and francine were deliberating on the means of saving the marquis from the more than doubtful generosity of corentin and hulot's bayonets i could go and warn him said the breton girl but we don't know where he is replied marie even i with the instincts of love could never find him after making and rejecting a number of plans mademoiselle de venouille exclaimed when i see him his danger will inspire me she thought like other ardent souls to act on the spur of the moment trusting to her star or to that instinct of adroitness which rarely if ever fails a woman perhaps her heart was never so wrung at times she seemed stupefied her eyes were fixed and then at the least noise she shook like a half uprooted tree which the woodsman drags with a rope to hasten its fall suddenly a loud report from a dozen guns echoed from a distance marie turned pale and grasped francine's hand 
i am dying she cried they have killed him the heavy footfall of a man was heard in the antechamber francine went out and returned with a corporal the man making a military salute to mademoiselle de vanille produced some letters the covers of which were a good deal soiled receiving no acknowledgment the blue said as he withdrew madame they are from the commandant mademoiselle de vanille a prey to horrible presentiments read a letter written apparently in great haste by hulot mademoiselle a party of my men have just caught a messenger from the gar and have shot him among the intercepted letters is one which may be useful to you and i transmit it etc thank god it was not he they shot she exclaimed flinging the letter into the fire she breathed more freely and took up the other letter enclosed by hulot it was apparently written to madame du bois by the marquis no my angel the letter said i cannot go to night to la devetiere you must lose your wager with the count i triumph over the republic in the person of their beautiful emissary you must allow that she is worth the sacrifice of one night it will be my only victory in this campaign for i have received the news that la fondée surrenders i can do nothing more in france let us go back to england but we will talk of all this to-morrow the letter fell from marie's hands she closed her eyes and was silent leaning backward with her head on the cushion after a long pause she looked at the clock which then marked four in the afternoon my lord keeps me waiting she said with savage irony oh god grant he may not come cried francine if he does not come said marie in a stifled tone i shall go to him no no he will soon be here francine do i look well you are very pale ah continued mademoiselle de vanille glancing about her this perfumed room the flowers the lights this intoxicating air it is full of, of that e celestial life of which i dream marie what has happened i am betrayed deceived insulted fooled i will kill him i will tear him bit by bit yes there was always in his manner a contempt he could not hide and which i would not see oh i shall die of this fool that i am she went on laughing he is coming i have one night in which to teach him that married or not the man who has possessed me cannot abandon me i will measure my vengeance by his offence he shall die with despair in his soul i did believe he had a soul of honour but no it is that of a lackey ah he has cleverly deceived me for even now it seems impossible that the man who abandoned me to piamiche should sink to such backstair tricks it is so base to deceive a loving woman for it is so easy he might have killed me if he chose but lie to me to me who held him in my thoughts so high the scaffold the scaffold ah could i only see him guillotined am i cruel he shall go to his death covered with caresses with kisses which might have blessed him for a lifetime marie said francine gently be the victim of your lover like other women not his mistress and his betrayer keep his memory in your heart do not make it an anguish to you if there were no joys in hopeless love what would become of us poor women that we are god of whom you never think marie will reward us for obeying our vocation on this earth to love and suffer dear replied mademoiselle de vanille taking francine's hand and patting it your voice is very sweet and persuasive reason is attractive from your lips i should like to obey you but you will forgive him you will not betray him hush never speak of that man again compared with him corentin is a noble being do you hear me she rose hiding beneath a face that was horribly calm the madness of her soul and a thirst for vengeance the slow and measured step with which she left the room conveyed the sense of an irrevocable resolution lost in thought hugging her insults too proud to show the slightest suffering she went to the guard-room at the port st leonard and asked where the commandant lived she had hardly left her house when corentin entered it oh monsieur corentin cried francine if you are interested in this young man save him mademoiselle has gone to give him up because of this wretched letter corentin took the letter carelessly and asked which way did she go i don't know yes he said i will save her from her own despair he disappeared taking the letter with him when he reached the street he said to galop chopin's boy whom he had stationed to watch the door which way did a lady go who left the house just now the boy went with him a little way and showed him the steep street which led to the port st leonard that way he said at this moment four men entered mademoiselle de vanille's house unseen by either the boy or corentin return to your watch said the latter play with the handles of the blinds and see what you can inside look about you everywhere even on the roof corentin darted rapidly in the direction given him and thought he recognized mademoiselle 
the vanilla through the fog he did in fact overtake her just as she reached the guard-house where are you going he said you are pale what has happened is it right for you to be out alone take my arm where is the commandant she asked hardly had the words left her lips when she heard the movement of troops beyond the port st leonard and distinguished hulot's gruff voice in the tumult god's thunder he cried i never saw such fog is this for a reconnaissance the gar must have ordered the weather what are you complaining of said mademoiselle de venille grasping his arm the fog will cover vengeance as well as perfidy commandant she added in a low voice you must take measures at once so that the gar may not escape us is he at your house he asked in a tone which showed his amazement not yet she replied but give me a safe man and i will send him to you when the marquis comes that's a mistake said corentin a soldier will alarm him but a boy and i can find one will not commandant said mademoiselle de venille thanks to this fog which you are cursing you can surround my house put soldiers everywhere place a guard in the church to command the esplanade on which the windows of my salon open postmen on the promenade for though the windows of my bedroom are twenty feet above the ground despair does sometimes give a man the power to jump even greater distances safely listen to what i say i shall probably send this gentleman out of the door of my house therefore see that only brave men are there to meet him for she added with a sigh no one denies him courage he will assuredly defend himself goudin called the commandant listen my lad he continued in a low voice when the young man joined him this devil of a girl is betraying the gar to us i'm sure i don't know why but that's no matter take ten men and place yourself so as to hold the cul-de-sac in which the house stands be careful that no one sees either you or your men yes commandant i know the ground very good said hulot i'll send beaupier to let you know when to play your sabres try to meet the marquis yourself and if you can manage to kill him so that i shan't have to shoot him judicially you shall be a lieutenant in a fortnight or my name's not hulot goudin departed with a dozen soldiers do you know what you have done said corentin to mademoiselle de venille in a low voice she made no answer but looked with a sort of satisfaction at the men who were starting under command of the sub-lieutenant for the promenade while others following the next orders given by hulot were to post themselves in the shadows of the church of st leonard there are houses adjoining mine she said you'd better surround them all don't lay up regrets by neglecting a single precaution she is mad thought hulot was i not a prophet asked corentin in his ear as for the boy i shall send with her he is the little gar with a bloody foot therefore he did not finish his sentence for mademoiselle de venille by a sudden movement darted in the direction of her house whither he followed her whistling like a man supremely satisfied when he overtook her she was already at the door of her house where galop chopin's little boy was on the watch mademoiselle said corentin take the lad with you you cannot have a more innocent or active emissary boy he added when you have seen the gar enter the house come to me no matter who stops you you'll find me at the guard house and i'll give you something that will make you eat cake for the rest of your days at these words breathed rather than said in the child's ear corentin felt his hand squeezed by that of the little breton who followed mademoiselle de venille into the house now my good friends you can come to an explanation as soon as you like cried corentin when the door was closed if you make love my little marquis it will be on your winding sheet but corentin could not bring himself to let that fatal house completely out of sight and he went to the promenade where he found the commandant giving his last orders by this time it was night two hours went by but the sentinels posted at intervals noticed nothing that led them to suppose the marquis had evaded the triple line of men who surrounded the three sides by which the tower of papago was accessible twenty times had corentin gone from the promenade to the guard-room always to find that his little emissary had not appeared sunk in thought the spy paced the promenade slowly enduring the martyrdom to which three passions terrible in their clashing subject a man love avarice and ambition eight o'clock struck from all the towers in the town the moon rose late fog and darkness wrapped in impenetrable gloom the places where the drama planned by this man was coming to its climax he was able to silence the struggle of his passions as he walked up and down his arms crossed and his eyes fixed on the windows which rose like the luminous eyes of a phantom above the rampart the deep silence was broken only by the rippling of the nonson by the regular and lugubrious tolling from the belfries by the heavy steps of the sentinels or the rattle of arms as the guard was hourly relieved the night's as thick as a wolf's jaw said the voice of pillemiche go on growled marcheterre 
and don't talk more than a dead dog i'm hardly breathing said the chouan if the man who made that stone roll down wants his heart to serve as the scabbard for my knife he'll do it again said marchatere in a low voice scarcely heard above the flowing of the river it was i said piumiche well then old money-bag down on your stomach said the other and wriggle like a snake through a hedge or we shall leave our carcasses behind us sooner than we need hey marchatere said the incorrigible piumiche who was using his hands to drag himself along on his stomach and had reached the level of his comrade's ear if the grand garce is to be believed there'll be a fine booty to-day will you go shares with me look here piumiche said marchatere stopping short on the flat of his stomach the other chouan who were accompanying the two men did the same so wearied were they with the difficulties they had met with in climbing the precipice i know you continued marchatere for a jack grabal who would rather give blows than receive them when there's nothing else to be done we have not come here to grab dead men's shoes we are devils against devils and sorrow to those whose claws are too short the grand garce has sent us here to save the gar he is up there lift your dog's nose and see that window above the tower midnight was striking the moon rose giving the appearance of white smoke to the fog piumiche squeezed marchatere's arm and silently showed him on the terrace just above them the triangular iron of several shining bayonets the blues are there already said piumiche we shan't gain anything by force patience replied marchatere if i examine right this morning we must be at the foot of the papa go tower between the ramparts and the promenade that place where they put the manure it is like a feather-bed to fall on if saint labre remarked piumiche would only change into cider the blood we shall shed to-night the citizens might lay in a good stock to-morrow marchatere laid his large hand over his friend's mouth then an order muttered by him went from rank to rank of the chouan suspended as they were in mid-air among the brambles of the slate rocks corentin walking up and down the esplanade had too practised an ear not to hear the rustling of the shrubs and the light sound of pebbles rolling down the sides of the precipice marchatere who seemed to possess the gift of seeing in darkness and whose senses continually in action were acute as those of a savage saw corentin like a trained dog he had scented him fouché's diplomatist listened but heard nothing he looked at the natural wall of rock and saw no signs if the confusing gleam of the fog enabled him to see here and there a crouching chouan he took him no doubt for a fragment of rock for these human bodies had all the appearance of inert nature this danger to the invaders was of short duration corentin's attention was diverted by a very distinct noise coming from the other end of the promenade where the rock wall ended and a steep descent leading down to the queen's staircase began when corentin reached the spot he saw a figure gliding past it as if by magic putting out his hand to grasp this real or fantastic being who was there he supposed with no good intentions he encountered the soft and rounded figure of a woman the devil take you he exclaimed if any one else had met you you'd have had a ball through your head what are you doing and where are you going at this time of night are you dumb it certainly is a woman he said to himself the silence was suspicious but the stranger broke it by saying in a voice which suggested extreme fright all my good man i am on my way back from awake it is the pretended mother of the marquis thought corentin i'll see what she's about well go that way old woman he replied feigning not to recognize her keep to the left if you don't want to be shot he stood quite still then observing that madame de Gois was making for the papa go tower he followed her at a distance with diabolical caution during this fatal encounter the chouan had posted themselves on the manure towards which marchatere had guided them there's the grand garce thought marchatere as he rose to his feet against the tower wall like a bear we are here he said to her in a low voice good she replied there's a ladder in the garden of that house about six feet above the manure find it and the gar is saved do you see that small window up there it is in the dressing-room you must get to it this side of the tower is the only one not watched the horses are ready if you can hold the passage over the nonsense a quarter of an hour will put him out of danger in spite of his folly but if that woman tries to follow him stab her corentin now saw several of the forms he had hitherto supposed to be stones moving cautiously but swiftly he went at once to the guard-room at the port st leonard where he found the commandant fully dressed and sound asleep on a camp bed let him alone said beaupier roughly he has only just lain down the chouans are here cried corentin in hulot's ear impossible but so much the better cried the old soldier still half asleep then he can fight when hulot reached the promenade corentin pointed out to him 
their singular position taken by the chouan they must have deceived or strangled the sentries i placed between the castle and the queen's staircase ah what a devil of a fog however patience i'll send a squad of men under a lieutenant to the foot of the rock there is no use attacking them where they are for those animals are so hard they'd let themselves roll down the precipice without breaking a limb the crack clock of the belfry was ringing too when the commandant got back to the promenade after giving these orders and taking every military precaution to seize the chouan the sentries were doubled and mademoiselle de venouille's house became the centre of a little army hulot found corentin absorbed in contemplation of the window which overlooked the tower citizen said the commandant i think the ci devant has fooled us there's nothing stirring he is there cried corentin pointing to the window i have seen a man's shadow on the curtain but i can't think what has become of that boy they must have killed him or locked him up there commandant don't you see that there's a man's shadow come come on i shan't seize him in bed thunder of god he will come out if he went in goudin won't miss him cried hulot who had his own reason for waiting till the guard could defend himself commandant i enjoin you in the name of the law to proceed at once into that house you're a fine scoundrel to try to make me do that without showing any resentment at the commandant's language corentin said coolly you will obey me here is an order in good form signed by the minister of war which will force you to do so he drew a paper from his pocket and held it out do you suppose we are such fools as to leave that girl to do as she likes we are endeavouring to suppress a civil war and the grandeur of the purpose covers the pettiness of the means i take the liberty citizen of sending you to you understand me enough to the right about march or it will be the worse for you but read that persisted corentin don't bother me with your functions cried hulot furious at receiving orders from a man he regarded as contemptible at this instant galop chopin's boy suddenly appeared among them like a rat from a hole the gar has started he cried which way the rue saint leonard beaupied said hulot in a whisper to the corporal who was near him go and tell your lieutenant to draw in closer round the house and make ready to fire left wheel forward on the tower the rest of you he shouted to understand the conclusion of this fatal drama we must re-enter the house with mademoiselle de venouille when she returned to it after denouncing the marquis to the commandant when passions reach their crisis they bring us under the dominion of far greater intoxication than the petty excitements of wine or opium the lucidity then given to ideas the delicacy of the high-wrought senses produce the most singular and unexpected effects some persons when they find themselves under the tyranny of a single thought can see with extraordinary distinctness objects scarcely visible to others while at the same time the most palpable things become to them almost as if they did not exist when mademoiselle de venouille hurried after reading the marquise's letter to prepare the way for vengeance just as she had lately been preparing all for love she was in that stage of mental intoxication which makes real life like the life of a somnambulist but when she saw her house surrounded by her own orders with a triple line of bayonets a sudden flash of light illuminated her soul she judged her conduct and saw with horror that she had committed a crime under the first shock of this conviction she sprang to the threshold of the door and stood there irresolute striving to think yet unable to follow out her reasoning she knew so vaguely what had happened that she tried in vain to remember why she was in the antechamber and why she was leading a strange child by the hand a million of stars were floating in the air before her like tongues of fire she began to walk about striving to shake off the horrible torpor which laid hold of her but like one asleep no object appeared to her under its natural form or in its own colours she grasped the hand of the little boy with a violence not natural to her dragging him along with such precipitate steps that she seemed to have the motions of a mad woman she saw neither persons nor things in the salon as she crossed her and yet she was saluted by three men who made way to let her pass that must be she said one of them she is very handsome exclaimed another who was a priest yes replied the first but how pale and agitated and beside herself said the third she did not even see us at the door of her own room mademoiselle de venouille saw the smiling face of francine who whispered to her he is here marie mademoiselle de venouille awoke reflected looked at the child whose hand she held remembered all and replied to the girl shut up that boy if you wish me to live do not let him escape you as she slowly said the words her eyes were fixed on the door of her bedroom and there they continued fastened with so dreadful a fixedness that it seemed as if she saw her victim through the wooden panels 
then she gently opened it passed through and closed it behind her without turning round for she saw the marquis standing before the fireplace his dress without being too choice had the look of careful arrangement which adds so much to the admiration which a woman feels for her lover all her self-possession came back to her at the sight of him her lips rigid although half open showed the enamel of her white teeth and formed a smile that was fixed and terrible rather than voluptuous she walked with slow steps toward the young man and pointed with her finger to the clock a man who is worthy of love is worth waiting for she said with deceptive gaiety then overcome with the violence of her emotions she dropped upon the sofa which was near the fireplace dear marie you are so charming when you are angry said the marquis sitting down beside her and taking her hand which she let him take and entreating a look which she refused him i hope he continued in a tender caressing voice that my wife will not long refuse a glance to her loving husband hearing the words she turned abruptly and looked into his eyes what is the meaning of that dreadful look he said laughing but your hand is burning oh my love what is it your love she repeated in a dull changed voice yes he said throwing himself on his knees beside her and taking her two hands which she covered with kisses yes my love i am thine for life she pushed him violently away from her and rose her features contracted she laughed as mad people laugh and then she said to him you do not mean one word of all you are saying base man baser than the lowest villain she sprang to the dagger which was lying beside a flower vase and let it sparkle before the eyes of the amazed young marquis bah she said flinging it away from her i do not respect you enough to kill you your blood is even too vile to be shed by soldiers i see nothing fit for you but the executioner the words were painfully uttered in a low voice and she moved her feet like a spoiled child impatiently the marquis went to her and tried to clasp her don't touch me she cried recoiling from him with a look of horror she is mad said the marquis in despair mad yes she repeated but not mad enough to be your dupe what would i not forgive to passion but to seek to possess me without love and to write to that woman to whom have i written he said with an astonishment which was certainly not feigned to that chaste woman who sought to kill me the marquis turned pale with anger and said grasping the back of a chair until he broke it if madame dugois has committed some dastardly wrong mademoiselle de venille looked for the letter not finding it she called to francine where is that letter she asked monsieur corentin took it corentin ah i understand it all he wrote the letter he has deceived me with diabolical art as he alone can deceive with a piercing cry she flung herself on the sofa tears rushing from her eyes doubt and confidence were equally dreadful now the marquis knelt beside her and clasped her to his breast saying again and again the only words he was able to utter why do you weep my darling there is no harm done your reproaches were all love do not weep i love you i shall always love you suddenly he felt her press him with almost supernatural force do you still love me she said amid her sobs can you doubt it he replied in a tone that was almost melancholy she abruptly disengaged herself from his arms and fled as if frightened and confused to a little distance do i doubt it she exclaimed but a smile of gentle meaning was on her lover's face and the words died away from her lips she let him take her by the hand and lead her to the salon there an altar had been hastily arranged during her absence the priest was robed in his officiating vestments the lighted tapers shed upon the ceiling a glow as soft as hope itself she now recognized two men who had bowed to her the comte de bovin and the baron du Janic, the witnesses chosen by montauran you will not still refuse said the marquis but at the sight she stopped stepped backward into her chamber and fell on her knees raising her hands towards the marquis she cried out pardon 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 her voice died away her head fell back her eyes closed and she lay in the arms of her lover and francine as if dead when she opened her eyes they met those of the young man full of loving tenderness marie patience this is your last trial he said the last she exclaimed bitterly francine and the marquis looked at each other in surprise but she silenced them by a gesture call the priest she said and leave me alone with him they did so and withdrew my father she said to the priest so suddenly called to her in my childhood an old man white-haired like yourself used to tell me that god would grant all things to those who had faith is that true it is true replied the priest all things are possible to him who created all mademoiselle de venille threw herself on her knees before him with incredible enthusiasm oh my god she cried in ecstasy my faith in thee is equal to my love for him inspire me do hear a miracle or take my life your prayer will be granted said the priest marie returned to the salon leaning on the arm of the venerable old man 
a deep and secret emotion brought her to the arms of her lover more brilliant than on any of her past days for a serenity like that which painters give to the martyrs added to her face an imposing dignity she held out her hand to the marquis and together they advanced to the altar and knelt down the marriage was about to be celebrated beside the nuptial bed the altar hastily raised the cross the vessels the chalice secretly brought thither by the priest the fumes of incense rising to the ceiling the priest himself who wore a stole above his cassock the tapers on an altar in a salon all these things combined to form a strange and touching scene which typified those times of saddest memory when civil discord overthrew all sacred institutions religious ceremonies then had the savour of the mysteries children were baptized in the chambers where the mothers were still groaning from their labour as in the olden time the saviour went poor and lowly to console the dying young girls received their first communion in the home where they had played since infancy the marriage of the marquis and mademoiselle de venouille was now solemnized like many other unions by a service contrary to the recent legal enactments in after years these marriages mostly celebrated at the foot of oaks were scrupulously recognized and considered legal the priest who thus preserved the ancient usages was one of those men who hold to their principles in the height of the storm his voice which never made the oath exacted by the republic uttered no word throughout the tempest that did not make for peace he never incited like the abbe Goudin, to fire and sword but like many others he devoted himself to the still more dangerous mission of performing his priestly functions for the souls of faithful catholics to accomplish this perilous ministry he used all the pious deceptions necessitated by persecution and the marquis when he sought his services on this occasion had found him in one of those excavated caverns which are known even to the present day by the name of the priest's hiding-place the mere sight of that pale and suffering face was enough to give this worldly room a holy aspect all was now ready for the act of misery and of joy before beginning the ceremony the priest asked in the dead silence the names of the bride marie natalie daughter of mademoiselle blanche de castron abbess deceased of notre dame de cise and victor amade duc de venille where born at la chasterie near alencon i never supposed said the baron in a low voice to the count that montauran would have the folly to marry her the natural daughter of a duke horrid if it were of the king well and good replied the comte du bavon smiling however it is not for me to blame him i like charette's mistress full and well and i shall transfer the war to her though she's not one to bill and coo the names of the marquis had been filled in previously and the two lovers now signed the document with their witnesses the ceremony then began at that instant marie and she alone heard the sound of muskets and the heavy tread of soldiers no doubt relieving the guard in the church which she had herself demanded she trembled violently and raised her eyes to the cross on the altar a saint at last said francine in a low voice give me such saints and i'll be devilishly devout added the count in a whisper when the priest made the customary inquiry of mademoiselle de venouille she answered by a yes uttered with a deep sigh bending to her husband's ear she said you will soon know why i have broken the oath i made never to marry you after the ceremony all present passed into the dining-room where dinner was served and as they took their places jeremy marie's footman came into the room terrified the poor bride rose and went to him francine followed her with one of those pretexts which never fail a woman she begged the marquis to do the honours for a moment and went out taking jeremy with her before he could utter the fatal words ah francine to be dying a thousand deaths and not to die she cried this absence might well be supposed to have its cause in the ceremony that had just taken place towards the end of the dinner as the marquis was beginning to feel uneasy marie returned in all the pomp of a bridal robe her face was calm and joyful while that of francine who followed her had terror imprinted on every feature so that the guests might well have thought they saw in these two women a fantastic picture by salvator rosa of life and death holding each other by the hand gentlemen said marie to the priest the baron and the count you are my guests for the night i find you cannot leave fougeres it would be dangerous to attempt it my good maid has instructions to make you comfortable in your apartments no you must not rebel she added to the priest who was about to speak i hope you will not thwart a woman on her wedding day an hour later she was alone with her husband in the room she had so joyously arranged a few hours earlier they had reached that fatal bed where like a tomb so many hopes are wrecked where the waking to a happy life is all uncertain where love is born or dies according to the natures that are tried there marie looked at the clock six hours to live she murmured can i have slept she cried toward morning 
wakening with one of those sudden movements which rouse us when we have made ourselves a promise to wake at a certain hour yes i have slept she thought seeing by the light of the candles that the hands of the clock were pointing to two in the morning she turned and looked at the sleeping marquis lying like a child with his head on one hand the other clasping his wife's hand his lips half smiling as though he had fallen asleep while she kissed him ah she whispered to herself he sleeps like an infant he does not distrust me me to whom he has given a happiness without a name she touched him softly and he awoke continuing to smile he kissed the hand he held and looked at the wretched woman with eyes so sparkling that she did not endure their light and slowly lowered her large eyelids her husband might justly have accused her of coquetry if she were not concealing the terrors of her soul by thus evading the fire of his looks together they raised their charming heads and made each other a sign of gratitude for the pleasures they had tasted but after a rapid glance at the beautiful picture his wife presented the marquis was struck with an expression on her face which seemed to him melancholy and he said in a tender voice why sad dear love poor alphonse she answered do you know to what i have led you to happiness to death shuddering with horror she sprang from the bed the marquis astonished followed her his wife motioned him to a window and raised the curtain pointing as she did so to a score of soldiers the moon had scattered the fog and was now casting her white light on the muskets and the uniforms on the impassable quarantin pacing up and down like a jackal waiting for his prey on the commandant standing still his arms crossed his nose in the air his lips curling watchful and displeased come marie leave them and come back to me why do you smile i place them there you are dreaming no they looked at each other for a moment the marquis divined the whole truth and he took her in his arms no matter he said i love you still all is not lost cried marie it cannot be alphonse she said after a pause there is hope at this moment they distinctly heard the owl's cry and francine entered from the dressing-room pierre has come she said with a joy that was like delirium the marquise and francine dressed montaurin in chouan clothes with that amazing rapidity that belongs only to women as soon as marie saw her husband loading the gun francine had brought in she slipped hastily from the room with a sign to her faithful maid francine then took the marquis to the dressing-room adjoining the bedchamber the young man seeing a large number of sheets nodded firmly together perceived the means by which the girl expected him to escape the vigilance of the soldiers i can't get through there he said examining the bull's-eye window at that instant it was darkened by a thick-set figure and a hoarse voice known to francine said in a whisper make haste general those rascally blues are stirring oh one more kiss said a trembling voice beside him the marquis whose feet were already on the liberating ladder though he was not wholly through the window felt his neck clasped with a despairing pressure seeing that his wife had put on his clothes he tried to detain her but she tore herself roughly from his arms and he was forced to descend in his hands he held a fragment of some stuff which the moonlight showed him was a piece of the waistcoat he had worn the night before halt fire these words uttered by hulot in the midst of a silence that was almost horrible broke the spell which seemed to hold the men and their surroundings a volley of balls coming from the valley and reaching to the foot of the tower succeeded the discharges of the blues posted on the promenade not a cry came from the chouan between each discharge the silence was frightful but quarantin had heard a fall from the ladder on the precipice side of the tower and he suspected some ruse none of those animals are growling he said to hulot our lovers are capable of fooling us on this side and escaping themselves on the other the spy to clear up the mystery sent for torches hulot understanding the force of corentin's supposition and hearing the noise of a serious struggle in the direction of the port st bernard rushed to the guard-house exclaiming that's true they won't separate his head is well riddled commandant said beaupier who was the first to meet him but he killed Goudin and wounded two men ah the savage he got through three ranks of our best men and would have reached the fields if it hadn't been for the sentry at the gate who spitted him on his bayonet the commandant rushed into the guard-room and saw on a camp bedstead a bloody body which had just been laid there he went up to the supposed marquis raised the hat which covered the face and fell into a chair i suspected it he cried crossing his arms violently she kept him cursed thunder too long the soldiers stood about motionless the commandant himself unfastened the long black hair of a woman suddenly the silence was broken by the tramp of men and corentin entered the guard-room preceding four soldiers who bore on their guns crossed to make a litter the body of montaurin who was shot in the thighs and arms they laid him on the bedstead beside his wife he saw her and found strength to clasp her hand with a convulsive gesture the dying woman turned her head recognized her husband 
and shuddered with a spasm that was horrible to see murmuring in a voice almost extinct a day without a morrow god heard me too well commandant said the marquis collecting all his strength and still holding marie's hand i count on your honour to send the news of my death to my young brother who is now in london write him that if he wishes to obey my last injunction he will never bear arms against his country neither must he abandon the king's service it shall be done said hulot pressing the hand of the dying man take them to the nearest hospital cried corentin hulot took the spy by the arm with a grip that left the imprint of his fingers on the flesh out of this camp he cried your business is done here look well at the face of commander hulot and never find yourself again in his way if you don't want your belly to be the scabbard of his blade and the older soldier flourished his sabre that's another of the honest men who will never make their way said corentin to himself when he was some distance from the guard-room the marquis was still able to thank his gallant adversary by a look marking the respect which all soldiers feel for loyal enemies in eighteen twenty seven an old man accompanied by his wife was buying cattle in the market-place of fougeres few persons remembered that he had killed a hundred or more men and that his former name was marchartere a person to whom we owe important information about all the personages of this drama saw him there leading a cow and was struck by his simple ingenuous air which led her to remark that must be a worthy man as for cibot otherwise called billemiche we already know his end it is likely that marchartere made some attempt to save his comrade from the scaffold possibly he was in the square at alencon on the occasion of the frightful tumult which was one of the events of the famous trial of riffel briand and la chanterie end of section seventeen end of the chouan by honore de balzac translated by catherine wormley